So welcome everyone, we'll get started a few minutes late, but thank you everyone for coming over to the UN this morning for this session, this seminar on information for development on mobilizing libraries in order to support the goals of the UN system in the Asia Pacific region. Without further ado, we have two opening speakers. So we have Mitch Sie, who is the head of uh, knowledge and communications at UNESCAP, UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia Pacific. And we have Barbara Lison, IFLA president. So I think first of all, we have Mitch. Hello, good morning. Good morning, Mitch, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Can you all hear me fine? I guess so. Uh, <clears throat> my, my, first of all, let me, let me just say my, my apologies. I'm not there. I really wanted to be there. Uh, I'm just not feeling, uh, I'm feeling a little bit under the weather. So I just thought uh, better safe than sorry. And of course, as we learned over the last two plus years, uh, thanks to the wonders of technology that doesn't uh, preclude me from still participating and, and joining you there in spirit. Um, as, as Stephen mentioned, my name is Mitch Shea. I'm a Chief of Communications and Knowledge Management here at uh, SCAP. Uh, and it's uh, definitely my pleasure to welcome you all uh, to Bangkok, uh, to the UNCC. Um, we're really excited to have you here. When uh, Carly uh, first brought this uh, to my attention, uh, it was actually uh, something we hadn't, or I personally hadn't considered. Um, you know, libraries being um, uh, advocates for uh, the sustainable development goals in the 2030 agenda. Um, and uh, I found a very, uh, the concept very intriguing and, and interesting. Uh, and of course, uh, if you know Carly, you know she's very enthusiastic and very much of a cheerleader for the role libraries can play uh, in, in whatever form uh, or whatever part of society that they're in. And um, so, uh, as I said, uh, it was very, uh, it was a very interesting idea. And uh, I'm also was pleased to learn that IFLA has been taking part in our uh, Asian and uh, Pacific uh, Forum on Sustainable Development the last couple of years, our main uh, uh, SDG forum uh, that we have every year. Uh, so I'm glad to see that there is that, uh, that link already. But I, I hope that this event um, is, is something that perhaps we can build on for future years, uh, because I like the idea that libraries being centers for a lot of different, uh, a lot of communities in a lot of different ways um, uh, can help us to amplify our message about sustainable development uh, and the 2030 agenda and so on. Um, uh, you know, I, I certainly have uh, fond memories growing up as a kid in the U.S., uh, traveling to the library every summer and uh, getting my collection of books and, and making my way through them. Uh, and I know that libraries, uh, uh, you know, are way more than that. Uh, and that's something I think that um, um, definitely my colleagues and uh, perhaps uh, some of our um, uh, diplomats here uh, at Bangkok that uh, represent their countries at SCAP uh, meetings uh, and, and, and certainly the public at large, uh, could uh, well understand and, and, and I think could appreciate uh, the, the, the growing role that libraries um, are playing nowadays um, <clears throat> in, 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 in a lot of different facets. So um, I, I, again, thank you very, very much for your interest in, in coming to uh, SCAP. And, uh, um, uh, you know, we worked with Stephen to develop the program, and I think it's a very rich and uh, interesting program. And again, uh, my regrets for not being able to be there, uh, but uh, I do wish you all a, a very good uh, day and um, I look forward to hearing uh, whatever outcomes uh, there might be from Carly and, and uh, uh, my best of luck uh, with uh, all of your endeavors in terms of, again, supporting the United Nations and supporting uh, the 2030 agenda and the sustainable development goals. So thank you very much. Now I'd like to ask Barbara Lison, if the president 2123, to take the floor. Barbara. Uh, That's the one. So I just move a little bit. <laughs> dear Mr. Sie, dear colleagues, thank you very much, Mr. Sie, for your words. And thank you also for your the amazing support that you and your team are giving for this organization of this event today. And thank you very much also, Mr. Sie, for your honest words that you 
are uh, now very interested in how the libraries can contribute to the UN SDGs and we will show that we will contribute as we are already contributing. For the moment that we started thinking about holding this event here in the context of our first in-person workshop since the pandemic, the idea of being able to engage with the United Nations was at the heart of our planning. We are convinced that libraries need to be closer to engage better with decision makers of any kind and of course the UN. Not just in order to secure their own financial future, but also, and this is more crucial, in order to make sure that we are providing answers to the key questions of our times from local government to the United Nations itself. It's a long bridge, of course. And now we are here. As our library participants will know by now, and as I hope our United Nations, UNESCO and national government participants will know by the end of the time here, libraries are particularly serious about delivering on the SDGs and the wider goals of the UN. Not just at the level of IFLA, where we have placed work and engagement in the SDGs since I see, I know since 2016 already, we are right at the top of our strategy. And we have to work on all levels. Even when we are not specifically labeling our work as such, when we are not working under the explicit SDG banner, the work of libraries is an excellent fit for what takes place within the building here in Bangkok. Libraries are committed to delivering on the whole range of development needs of populations. Libraries are taking the steps that unlock progress for individuals, for families, for communities and for societies as a whole. Libraries are placing an emphasis on finding solutions that work for all, guaranteeing rights, ensuring that nobody is left behind. Of course, access to information is recognized clearly in the SDGs and especially in the SDG 1610. I always say this is our heart of the SDG 1610. So we all have to remember 1610. If someone asks what about the SDGs and libraries say 1610. But arguably it appears in a total of 17 SDGs targets across the board, underlining how much of a cross cutting factor it is because information, the ability to access information, and the skills, confidence, and rights to use information are absolutely essential. Without information, there is no innovation, no communication, no progress. Without information, our decisions are based on guesswork, on our private lives, in our work, in our governments, and in also in the governance. And this is not really good if everything is only based on guesswork, is it? I know for our library participants here today, we are not only honored to be able to be here at the UN itself in Bangkok, but we are therefore also looking forward to understanding more about what matters for the UN. What are the key policy questions that the UN and UNESCO are asking right now, because we want to deliver answers. And in turn, I hope that those of you here from the UN, from UNESCO as well, will understand that libraries are valuable partners for development, a key ally, actually millions of allies who are already, already hard at work in our areas and in the areas you are focusing. My ambition is that we come out of this full of follow-ups, 
full of ideas or for conversions, we should continue and for conversations, we should continue. We should continue working on projects which we should explore, on resources we can mobilize in order to go further together. Thank you so much, Mr. Sier. Thank you very much, Carly, all for this opportunity here for that we can hear that we can be here today and is from which I believe we all stand get to gain and with it the communities we serve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you. So we have divided this morning up into four sessions, each focusing on a different area of focus of the UN system in Asia Pacific. The first two sessions will focus on areas that UN ESCAP, the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific is looking at. The second two will look more at UNESCO areas. So the first of these sessions is going to be on the sustainable development goals. And I hope you're not sick of the sustainable development goals yet. We obviously worked on this this morning. I'm happy to see the little pins on so many of you. <laughs> we have committed that much. We distributed pins. Um, I really don't think there's so much to add here on, on, on the topic of the SDGs themselves. I think we use them, not only do we deliver on them, but there's some really interesting work happening within the field that we'll hear about, I'm sure, on using the SDGs as a structuring principle, using them as a tool for thinking through what we do, using the power of libraries to promote the SDGs and really actually drawing on that potential, not on even on individual goals, but on the entire structure and the philosophy that underpins them. So we're extremely lucky today to be counting, to be able to count on Oliver Patterson, who is the chief of the countries with special needs section at ESCAP. He's been in this role for, for six years now, almost exactly. I saw you start in November, 2016. Um, he has a specific focus on least developed countries, on landlocked developing countries, and on small island developing states, which of course is a, a significant issue, especially obviously in the Pacific. He has a key role, for example, in implementing the Samoa pathway. In his work, he focuses on capacity building, on support for policy makers in order to design tools and approaches that enhance regional cooperation, um, uh, yeah, in, in, with regional cooperation. He's been working with the UN in various roles and around the world, in Latin America and the Caribbean, in Africa and in New York. So he really brings in a very strong understanding, knowledge of what the UN does across the field. And it's great to have him with us today. I will also invite to the stage two additional library representatives. I'd like to invite Claire Thorpe from the Australian Library Association and Pramila Gamage from uh, Verite Research, also associated with the Sri Lankan Library Association. So and then I will, while you're getting up to the stage, I will change the slot. Thank you. And then over to you, Oliver. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Stephen, for that introduction. Uh, I didn't realize that I'd already been in this post since November 2016, so it's amazing how uh, time flies when you, when you like what you're doing. Um, it's my pleasure today to, to present to you today on the sustainable goals, um, sustainable development goals in Asia and the Pacific. And uh, I must confess, this is a little bit of a different audience than we usually have. And, and uh, when I was putting this presentation together, I was trying to grapple a little bit with, with what kind of knowledge um, would you have, what you know about sustainable development goals and, and, uh, and, and how far you, you use them in your work. Um, so I think I'll, um, what I decided to do was uh, put a little presentation together where I'll explain a little bit how our region is uh, performing in reaching the sustainable development goals maybe some of the challenges um, that the countries are facing, um, and then highlight how ESCAP is, is trying to support implementation of the 2030 agenda in the region. Um, I'm not sure what I need to point this at. All right. Um, 
great. Okay, so so let me um, let me start. Um, of course, as you know, the um, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development was um, adopted unanimously by all member states of the UN in 2015, um, and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is essentially framed around the five P's, peace, prosperity, people, partnership, and the planet. Um, they provide a clear and comprehensive development framework that is meant to guide long-term planning um, and with a view to shaping the global and national development policies, while at the same time, though, taking uh, account of different national realities, capacities, and levels of development that countries have. Um, the framework places people at the center of development and urges governments to adopt a whole of society approach to ensure that no one is left behind in policy making. Um, and these goals are rooted in human rights and, and provide a clear roadmap for sustainable development. Um, ESCAP has provided a online data tool called the SDG Data Gateway, which allows users to access, monitor, uh, access and monitor data on progress in the region. Um, but also not only the region as a whole, sub-regions and uh, various country groups. You can see here a snapshot of the regional progress that um, the region has made, and the black vertical line indicates the yearly target. Uh, this was based on data in 2021. And the solid blue line represents progress towards the targets, while the red line um, represents regressing away from the yearly target. Now, as you can see here, for the region as a whole, um, the Asia-Pacific region is, is not on track to meet the, any of the sustainable development goals. Um, notably here also is that goals 12 and goals 13 are in serious regression in the region. And uh, if we continue business as usual, the region won't be meeting the development goals by 2030. However, progress differs across countries and groups of countries. And uh, here I provided a snapshot of the SDG progress of small island developing states in our region, um, because these are amongst the most vulnerable countries in our region. And we can see that these countries are even further behind than the region as a whole in implementing the 17 development goals. Uh, worryingly here, we can see six of the uh, SDGs are in regression. SDG six on clean water and sanitation, SDG 10 on reduced inequalities, um, SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities, um, goal 12 on responsible consumption and production, and goal 13 on climate action, and finally um, goal 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions, although the, the, um, we do have an insufficient uh, number of uh, or insufficient data for that. So I think one important question we have is what happens if um, what happens to the 169 targets if we continue business as usual? Well, the sad news is that uh, based upon current data, um, we're likely to only reach the um, 10 targets that are shown here in green. Uh, admittedly, it is maybe quite small, but um, if we continue business as usual, we'll only be reaching these 10 targets. Um, the majority of targets, which are highlighted here in, in an orange um, ochre kind of tone, um, is, uh, will be missed for the Asia-Pacific region by 2030 if we don't accelerate progress. And uh, the red targets here are where we need to actually have a U-turn in terms of our performance. We need to work much harder and, and move towards those goals. And finally, we have a, a large number of gray indicators which highlight that um, we don't even have data for these. Um, and in fact, we're still unable to measure data um, indicators for about, we're still able to, unable to measure progress for about one third of the targets um, in our region. So this clearly highlights significant data gaps. And uh, where are these data gaps? Well, I think um, there are some bells of alarm that should be ringing because um, we look at data availability, for instance, and uh, data availability for gender equality is quite weak. Um, we don't have a lot of data availability for life below water, um, peace, justice and strong institutions is uh, another SDG where we clearly have a lack of data. Now, as I mentioned, if we, if we carry on at um, the current rate of progress, we won't be reaching the goals by 2013, uh, 2030. Um, in fact, in 2017, um, the region had made about 4.4% progress and we had uh, expected at that rate that we would be achieving the goals in the region by 2052. Um, unfortunately, however, over time, um, progress has been um, decelerating. 
Um, in 2019, we estimated that the region would only be reaching the goals in, by 2057. And in fact, in our latest analysis, we were, are likely to only reach the goals about three and a half decades behind the schedule by 2065, if we carry on at um, the current rate of progress. Now, why does SDG progress look the way it does in our region? Um, some of the key challenges on SDG progress and implementation are widening disparities, data availability, and uh, national coordination. Um, for instance, the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change have exacerbated development challenges and highlighted that uh, more must be done, for instance, to um, expand protection, social protection for vulnerable populations, including women and children. Um, but regional data availability, um, although this has improved, as I uh, highlighted before, progress can't be measured for about one third of the data. And if we look, for instance, at the small island developing states, it's actually more than 50% of the data that can't be measured in these economies. Um, the majority of SDG indicators comes from three main sources, household surveys, national administrative data, and international data. And I think here more investment in techn uh, technical cooperation is needed so that we do have timeliness uh, and sustainability in, for instance, conducting national household surveys um, as one of the main sources of data. Now, let me maybe um, highlight how, um, highlight some of the country level support that ESCAP provides um, for countries in the region. Um, and uh, for instance, we've provided support to a number of uh, common country assessments in the region. This, this was a snapshot that we created for, for our work in 2021 last year. Um, we've provided support on the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Cooperation Frameworks in the region, as well as uh, voluntary national reviews, which I'll come to in a minute, and uh, voluntary local reviews. Uh, in the social sector, we've supported countries through our Leave No One Behind um, analysis. Um, but also in designing and implementing, for instance, disability inclusive policies and implementing the Madrid plan of aging, uh, plan of action on aging. Um, in the economic sector, we've supported countries in implementing foreign direct investment, um, foreign direct investment strategies. We've supported micro, medium and small enterprise policies. And uh, recently we've been quite working quite a lot on strengthening access to finance for uh, women entrepreneurs. Um, ESCAP has supported several countries in the region in um, complementing or completing national um, roadmaps on SDG 7 on energy. Um, and we've also been supporting countries through macroeconomic model on fiscal needs assessments and green financing options, um, especially in the COVID-19 pandemic. It's been clear that countries are, are facing significant fiscal challenges in addressing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and also accelerating progress on the SDGs. Um, we've supported countries in the civil registration and vital statistics um, efforts and uh, helped them to produce SDG progress assessments. And finally, we've also been assisting countries in implementing the SCAP cross-border paperless trade initiative and strengthening urban mobility and uh, transport corridors in the region. Now, maybe I can highlight here how progress on sustainable development is reviewed at the different levels, um, which of course you're all familiar with. At the national level, we have the voluntary national reviews, um, which are the primary way for member states to review their own progress. This is a country-led review progress on uh, sustainable development um, implementation that has taken place at the national level. And it's meant to galvanize stakeholder support and knowledge sharing and improvement of SDG data. And I'm sure as uh, librarians, you've been involved in these voluntary national reviews. Um, we've actually also created a, a, um, an SCAP twinning program in recent years, where we've been twinning countries that are presenting their voluntary national reviews. Um, the aim of this is to enable countries to learn together, to have a common peer review pro process, and also find out about some of their common challenges. And I think this has been um, taken up quite enthusiastically in the region, um, and is also being adopted now in, in some of the other regions. Um, we also have a toolbox of support that we provide to countries that are pre preparing their voluntary national reviews. Um, that would be a whole other presentation, so I won't be going into that. But it covers, for instance, the, the support on uh, data implementation, the leaving no one behind, some of the macroeconomic modeling that we've been doing. Um, at the sub-regional level, we've been organizing for the last six, seven years, um, sub-regional forums on sustainable development. 
Um, the, we just recently concluded the Southeast um, Asia Forum on Sustainable Development here in Bangkok. Um, we've concluded that for North and Central Asia and for East and Northeast Asia. Um, as you maybe know, SGAP has, has um, divided up our region into five sub-regions to um, take a little bit more into account common challenges, common um, um, challenges that countries face in, in our vast region. Um, and these sub-regional reviews on or these sub-regional forums on sustainable development ultimately feed into the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development, um, which we'll be organizing for the 10th time uh, next March, and which, as uh, you all know, you have also been um, joining for the last few years. Um, so these, this Asia Pacific wide forum on sustainable development um, is, is one of the most inclusive international forums that we have here at SCAP. Um, where we not only have the member states that join, but we have a range of um, different multi-stakeholders, civil society organizations that participate in here. Um, and the idea of this forum is, of course, as you know, to identify trends, good practices, and lessons learned. And these ultimately feed into the um, high-level political forum on sustainable development that takes place in New York, usually in July. Um, this year, there will be 11 countries from our region that are presenting voluntary national reviews. Um, we've already started work uh, with a number of them. For instance, we are starting a planning program, a uh, twinning program between uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Mongolia, given that they have certain cultural similarities um, and, and common interests and challenges that they face as landlocked countries. Um, and yeah, I think this, this brings my presentation to an end. Look forward to your discussion. Um, thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you very much. I know there's already interest in your PowerPoint, and I imagine that Umida from Uzbekistan, who's the director of the National Library there, will be interested in finding out more. Um, we have a number of the countries that are doing VNRs in the room at the moment. I, I did actually bother checking them out while doing them. So colleagues from Brunei, Cambodia, Fiji, the Maldives, Mongolia, Singapore, Uzbekistan, and Vietnam do have a look. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have some from Tajikistan or Turkmenistan here at the moment. Um, just say, uh, no, I, I think before handing over to our other library participants, I think that focus on the importance of data and evidence to support understanding is high. We recently put out a statement as the International Federation of Library Associations on the importance of evidence for sustainable development and the potential for working with library networks and especially libraries and research institutions to support this work. I think that's a, that, that's a really sort of crucial thing. I, mean, there's, there's, I hope there's potential to collaborate more. So now we have two library speakers who will talk a little bit about different perspectives on how they're working with the SDGs. First of all, I'm going to ask Claire Thorpe to talk a little bit about the work of the Australian Library Association in making the SDGs a guiding, a structure and principle. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to share the work that ALIA, the Australian Library and Information Association, has done and is doing with the Sustainable Development Goals to centre our advocacy and partnership work around 10 stretch targets. ALIA has demonstrated a strong commitment to the SDGs. Uh, we officially added the goals to our constitutional objects in 2017. Last year, at a round table of Australian library leaders, Stephen Weiber from IFLA, who's with us today, shared that the goals offer libraries a shared language to use with partners through which we can build networks, collaborate, and raise the visibility of libraries. This is the approach that Alia has taken in working with the SDGs to lead and partner in meaningful and enduring change. Our first engagement with the goals focused on working with Australian library staff to raise awareness of the goals and to identify ways in which libraries build stronger communities. Through this process, Alia identified the need to define concrete targets for a strategically selected number of goals that Australian libraries and Australian library and information professionals could use to work towards and demonstrate measurable impact with evidence. The 10 stretch targets we have selected provide strategic direction, 
identified activities and measures so that we can track our progress. And the goals we have selected to focus on are goals 3, 4, 13, 16 and 17. The targets have been developed with committed partners across the Australian library field and these partnerships are already achieving outcomes at the local and national level. Today I'll mention two stretch targets, one which focuses on our external advocacy to government and one which is focused on building the capacity and understanding within our industry. Target 1 aligns with SDG 4.2 and 4.6 to ensure that libraries are embedded in national strategies for early language and literacy. Through active membership of the National Early Language and Literacy Coalition and the Australian Media Literacy Alliance, we are beginning to see lasting benefits from our advocacy to and with the Australian Government national strategies for early language and literacy, and also for media literacy for young adults and, and adults are progressing, as is a national digital inclusion roadmap. And recently, our Students Need School Libraries campaign, in partnership with a number of industry partners across the school library sector, attracted national media attention. Target 5 aligns with SDG 4.7. And it recognises the need for our libraries to work more closely with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the First Nation and traditional owners of Australia. We need to ensure that our collections, services and spaces are managed in culturally informed, culturally respectful and culturally safe ways. And to do this, Alia has invited an Indigenous expert advisory group to provide a First Nations voice in the governance of our association. We know that there is much more we need to do in reconciliation and truth telling, and we are committed to building the cultural capability and competency among library and information workers to bring Aboriginal voices and ways of knowing and working to our industry and to our communities. The stretch targets that Alia has identified and adopted define sustainable development goals that are within the remit of Australian libraries and Australian library and information professionals. The stretch targets identify goals where Alia and our partners can make a measurable contribution and they provide us with a clear focus for our national advocacy efforts. The SDGs underpin the work we do in libraries and the vital role that we play in providing access to information, advancing literacy, health and wellbeing, education and climate action. At ALIA, we are proud to lead and to champion the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals in Australia. And we continue to find more opportunities to partner locally and in the region for the good of all people and the planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Now over to you, Pramila. Thank you very much for the opportunity given uh, to share our actions as the committee member of IFLA Asia, IFLA Asia Pacific Division and the council member of the Sri Lanka Library Association and the convener of its SDG committee. In, in March this year, uh, we organized a side event at UN Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development and participated in this room, it's SDG 17, 4 and 5 roundtables. <clears throat> at SDG 17 roundtable, we highlighted the role of transnational, national and local partnerships for achieving SDGs. The partnership model of Skills Online Sri Lanka program was highlighted in this session. I will talk more about this program later. During the roundtable SDG 4, we highlighted that during the COVID-19 pandemic, despite the closure of schools for over a prolonged period in the Asia Pacific, 
the libraries kept the doors of learning open in many countries, thus supported the learning agenda without fail. At SDG 5 Roundtable, we called for the need of promoting high-end skills among women and girls, especially for their participation in the fourth industrial revolution, and stressed that libraries provided a safe space for them to learn collaboratively and engage in gaining micro-credentials, leading to their employment and entrepreneurship as witnessed in Thailand, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, and few other nations in the region. We participated at the UN high-level political forum held in New York in July this year, where we had the great opportunity to meet and engage with UN missions, ministries, and key officials, and inform and discuss how libraries serve as cost-effective partners for advancing their development priorities. At local level, in December 2021, Sri Lanka Library Association approached the National Authority, the Sustainable Development Council of Sri Lanka, for, <coughs> to discuss the possibility of establishing a partnership. At this initial meeting, we discussed the ways in which libraries are raising awareness of the SDGs and contributing to their success. Further, we discussed how we can con contribute to Sri Lanka's voluntary national review. At this meeting, SDC requested Sri Lanka Library Association to develop an action plan for the purpose. Based on the discussion held and the priorities stated in the policy document, the National Policy and Strategy on Sustainable Development for a Sustainably Developed Sri Lanka, SLLA SDG Committee submitted the action plan with targets from 2022 to 2024. And we were able to, after reviewing the action plan and further discussions, we were able to establish the partnership. The official MU was signed in last September. Action in this plans cover, plan covered 13 SDGs with collaboration of all communities and professional groups of Sri Lanka Library Association and external partners include National Library of Sri Lanka, Colombo Public Library, and other <laughs> government and non-governmental sector. Also, SLLA is now working on introducing sustainable development and SDGs into its education program, which it has in all three languages, three-year diploma course. Uh, let me also share some other example with you, how the libraries in Sri Lanka responded to COVID-19 and supported SDGs. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the National Library of Sri Lanka formed a partnership with Commonwealth of Learning, Coursera Workforce Recovery Initiative, with the aim of helping job seekers in Sri Lanka to gain skills and reskill to enter into the job market. Coursera initiative offered unlimited access to large number of courses to gain a skill and reskill themselves. National Library also collaborated jointly with diverse local organizations such as the Vocational Training Authority, public libraries, educational institutions, especially work with disabled people, telecom organizations, and employers. At the end of the first phase, the program produced more than 4,300 learners who earned 21,343 certificates from world-renowned universities and institutes. As a result of the success of the program, and it outcomes, the Commonwealth of Learning extended the support till 2024, which included additional two learning platforms, Udemy and Grow with Google. The ongoing phase has already created more than 1,000 learners. So with this, the members of our region can provide more examples from their respective countries during the discussions. With 
ongoing uh, political and uh, political, economic, and social challenges. We are happy. I'm happy to share that the we are in par with the XLLA action plan, uh, immediate targets and goals, and uh, we hope that we will be able to achieve our midterm and long-term targets within the time frame. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pramila, and I, I really liked with those that these are systemic examples. This is working, it's not just in an individual library, in an individual community, this is working at the national level to actually try and make change happen and really engage with national efforts to implement the SDGs and Sri Lanka and Australia are not small countries as well. And we're talking about the national level, I just, I'm, I'm going to pick on Norad Zan very quickly. Hi, Norad Zan. <laughs> Um, because you had a very interesting example from the state of Sarawak, talking about promoting the SDGs, and it's quite recent news, but really exciting. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, uh, I'm from Malaysia, and uh, as everyone knows, Malaysia has got 14 states. So one of the states is Sarawak. It's in Borneo. And uh, for the past few years, ever since the pan pandemic, the Sarawak State Library, known as Pustaka, has been promoting SDGs rather rather a lot on their website and on their social media so it caught the attention of the premier or the chief minister of Sarawak and recently he gave more than uh, 1 million RM Malaysian ringgit to Pustaka or the Sarawak State Library to run their SDG programs and they are involved in areas of inclusivity and community education so the Sarawak State Library has been entrusted to do promotion and to create awareness a public awareness to communicate and to educate the masses or the people of Sarawak about what SDG is all about. So to us, this is, uh, to the libraries and librarians, this is one great example of how a state library managed to convince the state government that giving them money to run the SDG programs is, is a good example of what we can do. So other states are trying to emulate what Sarawak is doing. Thank you very much. I think that it highlights another key aspect of, of what libraries can do in terms of raising awareness and actually trying to get the, the sort of process that's taken place within Australia, getting that out into society. We have five minutes or so. Um, I don't know if you want to react to anything now or we can take a, one or two points from the floor and then you say a couple of words at the end. So is there anyone else who would like to contribute a little bit on what you've been doing around the SDGs? Please. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I'm Labi Bazain from Indonesia. Uh, I would like to talk about the experience uh, done by Indonesia relating to SDGs, especially for uh, uh, lo uh, lifelong learnings. Uh, the National Library of Indonesia has launched programs called Social Inclusion Based Library Transformation and uh, it has a lot of impact. Since then, Indonesia has implemented SDGs for uh, quality of education by having library boot to reach uh, communities surrounded by rivers, uh, three cycle car library to reach uh, the remote uh, area, uh, Libraries uh, also offer training for uh, recycling uh, garbage in West Java as uh, all already written in a book entitled Impact Stories from SDGs. Uh, Barbara has the book uh, last night. Yeah. Um, but uh, in, in Indonesia, in, in this case, I will focus on uh, the area of Gunung Kidul is one of uh, the uh, the district in, in, in Yogyakarta. Uh, in Indonesia, village and community libraries support uh, long life education by providing training for housewives to gain the knowledge and skill on making batiks, producing healthy food, digital marketing so that the housewife can get economic benefit from these activities. Uh, in Indonesia, libraries uh, got tagline from book into product, yeah, which means that the library provide collection as reference and ask the community to read the collection, providing training to implement what they read, 
producing product based on what they already read and what uh, they are already trained. After they already produce the product, they will read book on online marketing and they are trained to be online marketer to market their product. Yeah, basically library will provide collection and activities based on the social, uh, society need. For example, in a village in Gunung Kidul has a lot of banana tree. So the library provide reference collection relating how to make banana cakes, banana chip, and give cooking class to implement it. After they already have the product, they will be trained to do online marketing. The same thing happened with a lot of unused clothes in Gunung Kidul. The library provide reference how to make a doormat using clothes so the society can learn how to recycle their unused material and at the same time they can sell the product for their economic incomes i think that is uh, very uh, very interesting to see uh, if you want to see uh, a lot of more you can go to the youtube under the keyword community engagement and gunung kidul thank you thank you Lebeba. So I think this is a really interesting example. I know that it's a term used often by UNDP, the concept of development accelerators. And it's fascinating. I think we find in a lot of what we see that the combination of collections of information, but also the space and the support that libraries and library information workers can provide is a great sort of recipe for actually unlocking progress for sort of even just that little thing that allows someone to actually really fulfill their potential. And because we're talking about a whole network mm -hmm. of institutions that stretch across a country, I don't know what you've got, it's a hundred and, I'm trying to remember how many, it's, it, it, it's like six it's figures lot. of yeah. libraries in, mm -hmm. in, 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 in Indonesia. Indonesia, so it's, it's massive. So you have that potential for systemic change. Um, so I'm going to hand back to you, Jonathan. Uh, so, uh, so I can see Jonathan up there, so I'm having a Freudian <laughs> slip all of a sudden. <laughs> Um, back to you, Oliver, just to say a couple of closing words on this session, and then thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Stephen. I mean, closing words. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's, you know, very interesting to to be able to interact with with you as as librarians, because as I mentioned, it is a very different different role and, and a different group than, than the usual stakeholders that we interact with. And, and I think, you know, over the last few days, I have kind of spent a little bit more time thinking about, yes, I think, the, you know, the, the valuable role that libraries do, do play, of course creating awareness and sharing these uh, interesting examples and and um, basically educating educating people i mean I'm, I'm you know the the sdgs is something that you know when you work at the un you kind of live and breathe the sdgs and you deal with them every day but when you actually talk outside to people i'm, I'm sometimes surprised how, how there are differences in countries and communities about awareness about the sdgs I was recently re reading, for instance, in, in uh, Japan, the SDGs have really been embraced by business um, and, and that you see SDGs everywhere being advertised or promoted. Um, but that's certainly not the case everywhere. And, and I certainly think there's, there's a, a much larger role to play. Um, I'm pleased to hear that the um, um, organization on library, or the IF, IFPLA, is, is, uh, has been attending the, the APFST. Um, I think maybe we can think about how, how one can kind of integrate your work a little bit more into the work that we've been doing. For instance, um, um, the, the section that I lead um, organizes actually the APFSD, so we're kind of responsible for putting it together. Um, where we draft the, the uh, partnership report in collaboration with UNDP ADB, um, and maybe we can, we can think about um, some, some ideas on, on we can, you know, how to highlight some of the roles that you've been doing in there. Um, that would be all for me. Thanks very much. I think it's a yes from us. <laughs> thank you so much. So thank you to Oliver. We've come to the end of our first session. Thank you very much for your time and coming here today, and especially coming to join a, a, an a traditional and non-traditional meeting for you. But I hope it's this becomes more traditional. That's the goal. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, and thank you to Claire and to Pramila. So our next session. We'll focus more on innovation and development a little bit more. So I am very glad to welcome to the stage Jonathan Wong. And also we have uh, Misako. Misako-san, are you here? Excellent. Misako, please come join us on the stage. And also I'm going to invite Elvira Lapuz from the Philippines. And I'm going to do this.
So just while people get up to the stage, briefly to introduce Jonathan, he's the Chief of Technology and Innovation at UNESCAP. I'm not going to explain the acronym anymore, I think you've heard it enough. Um, he's been a Schwab Fellow, a Schwab World Fellow since 2019 as well. Um, he's part of the founding team of the Global Innovation Fund. Um, <clears throat> he used to be Head of Innovation at the Department for International Development, DFID, in the UK and also worked a lot on health and health innovation at the UK National Health Service. He's a champion in supporting governments in Asia Pacific to harness the power of social innovation and entrepreneurship. And uh, within the area, he focused very much on supporting policymakers on science, technology and innovation, digital economy development, social enterprise. And so this work fits in There's a lot around technology, a lot around innovation, a lot around social issues. So, to that end, I'm very happy that we have Misako Ito, who works a lot around technology, and in particular technology for inclusion in Japan, and Elvira, who basically does everything. So that's, <laughs> and Elvira is also a, a veteran of the Asia Pacific, so this is not the first time you've been to this building as well. So let's start over to you, Jonathan. Thank you for that kind introduction. And you know, as, as Oliver said, this isn't our usual audience. And I never get nervous when I speak, but I'm a, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> so, 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 so number one. Uh, and number two, I, I do pray um, that, that, that some of what I say today is gonna be, gonna be of interest or, or hopefully insightful in, in some shape or form. So, so uh, as Steve mentioned, I'm Jonathan Wong, the Chief of Technology Innovation here at SCAP. And I, I thought maybe today I'd share with you kind of a bit of um, uh, an overview of kind of SCAP's priorities on digital, um, maybe a bit about our work uh, and really how this all links to um, the, the role of libraries in, in the digital agenda as well. So, uh, um, uh, as Stephen mentioned, I, I predominantly focus on supporting governments to develop um, digital policies and strategies. Uh, and on the question of kind of our priorities, I, I've heard the word inclusion mentioned several times, and that certainly is our priority. I, I, I think, I think, as we all know, kind of accelerated digital transformation has been kind of a defining feature of the pandemic. You know, we, we've all gone online. It's kind of done my job for me, right? <laughs> Having advocated for digital for so long, it's kind of people had to do it anyway. You know, um, businesses that have access to e-commerce and digital finance have been able to kind of function much better. You know, all of us here today have been kind of working online in, in many of our countries. Our kids have been um, using e-learning. We've been accessing e-health e services. But, but as I mentioned, kind of inclusion is really at the heart of what we do at SCAP because it's, it's really hard for any of us to imagine that in our region, over 2 billion people do not have access to digital world. And, and that's really quite, when I heard that, it was quite frightening because how, how dependent we all have been on digital for the past couple of years uh, and, and indeed now. So here that was really striking. So, so, so that's, that's why we advocate for and always say that inclusion must be at the heart of government digital policies and strategies if, if the SDG promise, which I'm sure Oliver mentioned earlier, um, of leave no one behind is to be met. And when we talk about um, digital inclusion, we talk about five core foundations of the digital economy. So, so, so the first one is obviously connectivity. You know, if you don't have access to a mobile device or, 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 or the internet, you kind of can't do much. Uh, and we've seen kind of really interesting inclusion policies, say in Thailand as an example here, where, where the government has, has, has promoted and, and, and funded free public Wi-Fi spots and, and hotspots and these sorts of things. Of course, connectivity is nothing about skills. If you don't know how to use a, a computer or, or, or a phone to access information or, or whatever it may be, or services, it, it's kind of largely redundant. So, so additionally, kind of as another example in Turkey, um, with the inclusion point in mind, they have something called the Connected Women digital skills initiative, which specifically focuses on, or, or, on women uh, and developing their digital skills. Of course, digital ID is quite a controversial topic actually, but has come more to the fore during the pandemic. And to give, a, to give an example in Bangladesh, they rolled out the fastest ever um, digital ID system, really just to allow them to get social protection payments to the very poorest communities who were really struggling. So we talk about digital ID as a foundation. Uh, of course, I mentioned the kind of the economic aspects of digital as well, and mentioning that businesses that have access to e-commerce have, have survived much better than those that have not. And, and, and we've seen countries like China specifically focus rural areas 
in engaging people and skills training and getting them on board on, on, on e-commerce. Uh, and, and of course, on digital finance as well. I mean, many people can't run businesses or, 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 or pay school fees or maybe without a bank account. And we've seen that in Fiji, where we've worked with the Fiji government on the financial inclusion strategy and how actually digital technologies can feed into that. So, so they're, they're kind of the five core foundations we look at and all the time trying to integrate inclusion into that, really reaching the very poorest communities, women and girls, elderly people, etc. And indeed, just more, more, more recently, um, under Indonesia's president of the G20, um, we were really pleased that Indonesia put um, the engagement of vulnerable groups in the digital economy as one of their core priorities um, in, their, in their presidency. And they specifically looked at women, older people, rural communities, and MSMEs and informal companies as really kind of groups or vulnerable groups as the terminology the G20 uses to come up with a set of policy recommendations around how G20 countries could actually um, um, engage those groups in the digital economy. So, so that's kind of just an overview of what we do. I mean, just, just on another point, we actually, my background is, is in venture capital. So I, I used to invest in startups, which people ask me how I ended up in the UN. I, I don't know. It was, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long, long story. <laughs> so, 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 so I do try and keep that element of my work actually. And, and we've invested in a lot of kind of digital startups with this inclusion aspect in mind. So, so let me give an example. In Cambodia, a big problem for women entrepreneurs is that they, if you look at the statistics, less so than men get loans from banks to run their businesses, shall we say. And, and a big problem with that is, is sometimes the women entrepreneurs don't have maybe the financial literacy skills, you know, to really kind of provide the documentation to banks to actually get a loan. Uh, and we worked with a startup in Cambodia called She Investments. I, I call it a very cool app on a very uncool topic. So the topic was finance and accountancy. But what this allowed women entrepreneurs to do was very simply put into uh, an app what they were spending, what money was coming in. And it automatically generated the financial records that they could then go to banks to and actually get funding uh, and, and help support that way. So, so yeah, we, we, we do fund kind of startups in that respect as well. So that's kind of just a, a brief overview of our work. Now, now on the kind of how this all relates to libraries or not, so I, I, again, I'm pretty nervous about what I'm going to say now, but, but I, I think having, ha, having heard um, what was said earlier, I, I think a lot of it will resonate and, and seeing what's on the rest of the agenda. You know, I probably shouldn't say this, but I, I'm a bit of a Luddite when it comes to technology. You know, I, I do and I have had technology innovation in my job title for a number of years now, I won't tell you how long. But I mean, I, I still prefer a notepad to an iPad, right? You know, a paper book to a, <laughs> to a Kindle. Um, and, and really kind of with that in mind, I wanna kind of make three points around maybe the role, role of libraries in the agenda that I outlined. You know, we all watch the news and, and we're seeing Twitter kind of I don't know, positioning itself as the global digital town hall, if you like. Uh, and, and I think certainly it's critical, given that the importance of human contact in the physical world as well, that, 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 that really, we need to complement that by physical spaces for learning, knowledge generation, reflection, rooted really in local communities as well. Uh, and, and this is where I think libraries can play a really critical role. And, and from what I heard this morning, I heard so much around how libraries are acting as a space to kind of get the unconnected connected, you know, and, and provide those kind of public spaces where, where the, some of the two billion people in our region can actually access, access as well. And also I heard a lot around kind of the skills development as well. So I think certainly we need more of that because there are still two billion people <laughs> you know, in, in the region who, who don't have access to that. I, I think the second point I would make is that ha having said that kind of the, Digital has been such a positive for us all during the pandemic. You know, we, our kids can still go to school, people can run their businesses, we can still see the doctor online. That there are some pretty significant and, and kind of quite philosophical drawbacks, right? I think misinformation is one of the big ones. You know, we've, I've seen speeches from presidents which are just deep fakes, you know, that looks so real that you would believe that the president was saying that. So I think misinformation is one. And I think the second one, which is, probably going to be one of the biggest challenges of our time will be job displacement. You know, we were talking about AI taking jobs away. So, so, so I, 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 think, I think in that regard, and with these two points in mind, kind of what is the role of libraries in 
addressing this mis mis misinformation point uh, and actually supporting lifelong learning um, for people who, mostly the very poorest as well, who, who, who are likely to be, be, be displaced by fourth industrial revolution technologies. Kind of what is the role of governments in all of, uh, sorry, libraries in all of that. The, the final point I will make is just around the importance of diversity of knowledge. Now, um, I know a little anecdote. When I, I, I studied, I mentioned I was in venture capital, uh, and I studied for a financial um, professional qualification. And I used to study, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm British. Uh, I used to study in London at the British Museum. So, which has that beautiful library, right? <laughs> I used to kind of go there most nights and most days. And I wasn't a very good student. And, and I would do anything possible to avoid reading that very dry finance textbook that was in front of me. And I read all sorts of stuff. You know, I'd go around the library, pick up books, just everything from kind of romantic poetry to, 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 to history. And actually, I'll be honest with you, when, when it came to the actual exam, I found it quite useful, actually. You know, you start linking different areas. Uh, and the reason I, I think this diversity of knowledge is, is really important in the digital age is because many, let me give an example, many of the technology developers out there learn how to code. They read technology books. But, but many of the big challenges we're facing today have different dimensions of knowledge that are needed. So, so to give an example, you know, a guy or a woman um, developing a, 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 a self-driving car. You know, do you prioritize in a crash situation the life of the passenger or the pedestrian? Because sometimes there are choices, um, however, how we want to frame that. Uh, and I think certainly, I think when I, I speak to a lot of technology developers and governments developing technology and, and within the education system, what I say is the more technical knowledge around how to code and how to develop technology has to be complemented with other knowledge areas, moral philosophy, ethics, you know, and, and what is kind of the role of, again, of libraries in diversifying the knowledge base of these very young, bright people who are, whether we like it or not, probably shaping our destiny <laughs> at this very moment in time and doing it very quickly. So I think certainly the role of libraries in, in providing that diversity of knowledge, specifically in the kind of communities and the people who I work with, I think will be incredibly important. Um, I, I'm watching the clock, so I, I, I will stop there and, and maybe hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I think what you were saying was fascinating. Is we had an exercise yesterday where we have a set of 10 highlights and opportunities that were the result of a survey that we carried out pre-pandemic. Two of these very much focused on digital issues. And when we asked people back in 2018 which ones you felt were most important, the digital ones came out as being the ones we really needed to work on. When we asked this yesterday, right down there. I think, you know, I think everyone, a lot of people's neuroses about digital have, have gone because they've no, we can do it. <laughs> Actually, we don't need to be so scared of it. So that, I know that was a, a fascinating thing. I think the points you make about lives and lifelong learning, we definitely agree with it. it it's a regular argument on our side that if you want to, I know, you can't just rely on schools. Schools are there for the five to 18s, the K-12s, but once people leave schools, you don't have that infrastructure behind you, so you need those sorts of, that sort of support. There's a number of other things, but I think firstly I'd like to go to Misako to give the Japanese take. Hello, everyone. And uh, I, I'm a little bit nervous like you, <laughs> because I, I, I wonder if I can I'll let you understand what I want to say sure, uh, from the perspective of disability. Because uh, a disability inclusive library com community, including my organization and the Japan Library Association, has been focusing on those who are left behind for many years, before SDGs, after SDGs, and, and such as the people with this disability and uh, with a diversity, diverse uh, disabilities. So uh, based on the above experience, let me introduce accessible ICT uh, as a strategy to uh, make a library stronger and maybe escape stronger to ensure uh, information accessibility for those who are left behind. Uh, we try to 
uh, no one left, left behind. That is a concept, my speech. Uh, and uh, so that one example is Daisy. Have you ever heard of Daisy? Digital Accessible Information System. Uh, Daisy originally started as an international standard of digital talking books for persons with visual impairment. It is developed and maintained by Daisy Consortium, who consist, which consists of uh, more than 50 countries and uh, established by IFLA, LPD, a library services for people with print disability section. And uh, the, in, it is established in 1996. It has involved in multimedia standard uh, that can meet the needs of wide range of people with a leading disability, such as blindness, low vision, dyslexia, and the other print disabilities. Since uh, you, you now focus on the diversity, so maybe uh, it's a key point we can share. <laughs> and and uh, the, the integration of DAISY with accessibility EPUB format. Have you ever heard of EPUB? E-publication, which is an industrial format. When you use iPad, maybe the uh, EPUB can be supported by those I iPads. So uh, the, uh, it's an industrial standard, a little bit different from DAISY, but uh, they, if they are accessible, uh, the, uh, it has uh, the accessibility of DAISY. So for that, you can use it at the mainstream devices, like uh, iPhone and iPod, then uh, you can support people with disabilities at the same time because the integration of DAISY into EPUB format. Maybe it's a new challenge for you, but uh, I'd like you to understand what it is. <laughs> so, and, uh, so regarding this, we ha I have uh, two cases in Japan. Uh, the one case is the uh, uh, if the library services for persons with a disability, I'm sorry, Japan Library Association, <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> library services for people with uh, disability committee has conducted various activities for uh, promote, for, to promote inclusive library services in public libraries. And uh, they're based on the so-called Leading Barrier Free Act 2019. Maybe the, uh, our country supports our uh, intention to make a pe people with disability uh, understand easily or access to internet. So, uh, the, uh, that's why we, uh, the, the Japan has established reading Barrier Free Act. Everyone has a right to read. So, they, and then uh, we, uh, JL Library Association, held a training about the library services and uh, provided in the video with the language, sign language, and caption at the same time. And then uh, they talk about the uh, what the DAISY is and the very, why the, the DAISY is useful for people with special needs or disability or other print disabilities. And uh, other cases, uh, actually my organization get involved in the producing and the providing DAISY textbooks for students with the, the uh, elementary students and the junior high school students with a disability uh, for the un understand more books or textbooks in schools. So uh, now there are more than like, 10,000 uh, users. 
So uh, I, I think that it's, uh, it's uh, partly funded by Japan. So uh, two cases I, I uh, introduce you, but uh, as I already mentioned, library can achieve more of the, the uh, like uh, SDG goals, particularly quality education. I really to emphasize it, and uh, the uh, and the various technology and with accessible resources might be uh, valuable. And in this case, maybe library is a valuable partner and ally. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think that clarifies, that confirms so much that focus on inclusion and using libraries' understanding mm -hmm. of what users actually need and the importance of taking that time. So not just working at the macro level, but also you know, the leave no one behind logic mm -hmm. that, that, that Oliver mentioned as well. Elvira, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share about some of the digital inclusion initiatives uh, being done in, in the Philippines. Well, first, have computers and we'll set up platform for affordable or free of charge access for citizens in rural and underserved areas to various communication resources, most particularly the internet. And I'm talking about the tech for ed or the technology for education, employment, entrepreneur and economic development. It is a digital inclusion initiative by the Department of Science and Technology with the goal of expanding access to information and communications technology enabled services, learning resources, and opportunities for entrepreneurship and employment. It caters to disadvantaged communities, such as those in the rural and urban poor areas, the PWDs, and indigenous communities. It is about creating equal opportunities for everybody. A public library only needs at least three computers and internet connectivity, and the DICT will work with them immediately to set up the Tech for Ed platform. Our national library is quite optimistic that Tech for Ed will make public libraries more responsive to the needs of different sectors, as it offers the platform with very useful content like the alternative learning systems via e-edu skills, as well as easy access to government services under the eGov CERB. Tech for Ed serves as conduit for efficient delivery of government and other services, an important tool for the empowerment and participation of the unserved and, and underserved communities and development. These platforms that can be you know, accessed via public libraries will make citizens, you know, be able to avail of services that ordinarily will not be available for them. So it's, this is through the public libraries and via the Tech for Ed platforms that will make it easier for them. So talking about leaving no one behind, this is it for the public libraries in the Philippines and the Tech for Ed initiative. Another initiative, if I may share, is the Starbucks. You know, we have, we have this love for coining terms or acronyms. So Starbucks stands for Science and Technology Academic and Research-Based Openly Operated Kiosk, Starbucks. It's a standalone information source designed to reach those with limited or no access to science and technology information resources. Another initiative by the Department of Science and Technology uh, it aims to provide uh, science, technology, and innovation-based content in various formats to students and other, con other constituents in geographically isolated and economically challenged schools and communities throughout the country. It contains hundreds of thousands of digitized science and technology resources in various formats, be it text or video or audio. Please in specially designed pods set in a user-friendly interface, public libraries included. Another initiative is the CHED Connect or the Commission on Higher Education Connect, 
which is a web application that contains higher education course materials in text, media, and other digital assets that are useful for teaching, learning, and research purposes. This initiative expands opportunities for interdisciplinary teaching and learning by allowing teachers and instructors to integrate and revise multiple educational resources. Okay, talking about making learning and teaching more collaborative and ultimately more interesting as well. So these three digital inclusion initiatives are just some of the government-led projects which the library are easily involved that should receive continued support and further development. These are key examples that demonstrate how the role of libraries are getting more and more significant in furthering the government's efforts to break the digital divide, which is critical to ensuring quality education. Yes, quality education, that is SDG number four. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's fascinating. Firstly, obviously, that underlines that the transformation and how we think about what is the information to which libraries give access from from the collections mm -hmm. to actually how to navigate the broad information space and i know that a lot of us will be able to talk about information literacy i think that point about access to government services is fascinating because traditionally government services are there to promote equality to fight against the tendency of the market to divide and deliver to some and not others but ironically, without the input of libraries, without connectivity, digital public services divide people because they give some people access and some people not. So avoiding that contradiction is super important. I know that there's a couple of others of us in the room who I've talked to in the margins who I think might have interesting things to put in to input on this as well. I'd like to ask Alinda from Saipan in the Northern Marianas. Alinda? Ah, oh, you're there. Okay, you're super close by. <laughs> my blind spot. But yeah, so there's some really interesting examples along these same lines from the Northern Marianas. Hi, half a day, early in Danapati. I'm the president of Piala and I'm also the state librarian for the Northern Marana Islands. Um, I'm, I'm glad to share with you all this morning that we were recently awarded the um, uh, sustainable, the most sustainable project uh, for our technology mobile express. And um, our technology mobile express is actually a it's a community pillars program, and um, it is a digital equity project under OPD broadband team. And it is um, our goal, one goal for the cinema as part of our SDG number nine, is to support planning efforts that include subsidy programs or community uh, connections hub to ensure that all residents of Saipan, Tinian, and Rhoda have access, home access to the internet through our um, Technology Mobile Express. So our Technology Mobile Express um, consists of a, it's an eco-friendly passenger van that was transitioned into a Technology Mobile Express. It has access to Wi-Fi, laptops, PC handheld devices, printer, and our staff actually conducts resume classes, uh, word processing classes, Excel classes, and other um, classes that are are, are required or requested by our community members. And we serve mostly the underserved and underprivileged of our community, community members. Another program that we recently um, launched in an eco-friendly van is a brand new bookmobile. And I, this is in line with SDG1. And we are actually sending this bookmobile to one of the outer um, islands of the Northern Moranas which is the island of Rhoda, to provide the community with uh, equitable access to information and um, uh, books. So um, I'm, glad, I'm, I'm actually really glad to share this with everyone as a member of Piala and also a member of IFLA. Thank you. Thank you, Alinda. And I was secondly, and then I will open up the floor. So do be thinking, and I think in particular, there must be some really great examples of work being done on information literacy out there. But Roland has the misfortune of sitting next to me and said something really interesting yesterday that tallied with what you were saying about diversity of knowledge. So I might ask Roland to talk a little bit about the role of libraries in making sure that we're actually safeguarding that diversity of knowledge. So Roland. 
Huffity, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm Roland Nicholas. I'm the head librarian at the University of Guam uh, in the Robert F. Kennedy Library, and I'm also the vice president of Piala. I'm Erlinda's bodyguard. <laughs> at, the, at the University of Guam, we have a sustainability office, and they are attempting to implement all of the SDGs in some manner. And we have a collaboration with the library, the Office of Sustainability, and the Office of the Lieutenant Governor. They funded two cultural heritage uh, programs. Uh, one was in uh, cultural seafaring. So we have one of the master navigators who trained under Master Mao uh, in uh, Micronesian navigation. And then we also have a traditional healer uh, program. The, I, the library is involved in the traditional healer one. Uh, I serve as the librarian and historian, so I provide all the resources that we have in our collections. Uh, I scan them, I put them available for the, uh, the um, professors to use and the students to access uh, on, the, on the online uh, platform that we use. And um, we're developing uh, six courses in the master's level, where if they finish the, the courses, they uh, earn a certification to be an apprentice in, uh, under any cultural healer on Guam. And so there is a master's, uh, there are masters in cultural healing. They're called Jo um, which is a Chamorro name for traditional healers. Traditional healers. She speaks Chamorro, I don't, um, but we're both Chamorro uh, from different islands, different governments, but same culture. Um, and uh, so far we've created one class called uh, Ethnobotany. So it's a collaboration with the library the School of Health and the College of Natural and Applied Sciences, Office of Sustainability, and the Lieutenant Governor's Office. So it's a, it's a lot of moving parts. And uh, basically, the, the goal is uh, to have students be able to identify, um, process, uh, prepare the medicines, and then uh, distribute it to the uh, uh, clients that are in need of these um, medicines to serve as a, a alternative means of homeopathic remedies uh, in the islands. And so uh, our head, Joamti, is actually from Rhoda, and she's uh, the one creating uh, uh, plants. She's already planting, and I think we have like 80 plants ready to go, and the goal is to have like 300 uh, cultural um, remedies uh, set before the program is done. So it's cultural heritage, it's uh, library work, all in one, and. Uh, I'm a big part of it and I love it. And we just we were just so lucky to fall in the right place in the right time uh, with the SDGs and the Office of Sustainability. So it's a great program and it just took a, a, a one person to, to see that the data shows that these cultural practitioners are aging out and there is no one to replace them. And this allows that to, to uh, happen. So that's our program. It, 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 it's such a great way of making sure that there's not just an orthodoxy of knowledge out there from a certain source and a certain way of thinking. I think, I know, I, in parallel with this, and it's a different tack, and my home is copyright. And I admit, I know, this is also an area where there's a strong argument for open access, because unless you have open access, everyone sticks to their discipline and you just buy what you get in that discipline. So whenever, and then this is a huge issue for libraries, making sure that those programmers and those developers and those people working on AI in a certain area, if they're going to consider other disciplines, they need to have access to the material. And so I know that focus on making sure that all of the information is available and not just that which is of most interest to your faculty is always an interesting one. So we've got another 10 minutes of this session. I hope I've given you long enough to think about what you would like to say from the floor. <laughs> I've been trying to see you. Delara, excellent, thank you. <laughs> and then Winston after Delara. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Dilara from Bangladesh. I would like to uh, tell about more uh, regarding what we are doing in Bangladesh. In our country, the uh, the motto of our government is to make the Bangladesh digital. So under this that program, actually, there is a special wing is developed by the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, and the name of that program is Aspire to in 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 Innovation. That is A to I, and under that A to I, actually, uh, they have created eight thousand two hundred. 150 digital centers in different different areas and they also created uh, 64 districts we have and 64 information centers and we are the librarian we are actually closely involved with this uh, project 
because we are the people we can help them to find out the right information, how to access that information quickly. And from my library, we have introduced online information literacy courses, classes for everyone. So in that course, actually, we try to help, especially in this pandemic area, uh, how to get the information from your part, because people are not moving out. They have to stuck in the home. But how can how they can get the authentic information? Where is the right place to find the information? So in that case, we have developed a special website, web corner for coronavirus related authentic information, how to check the fact checker uh, uh, tools is over there. So we put it everything over there so that, you know, people of people and the community will be benefited. And rather than this, uh, we, uh, you know, about the digital divide, and maybe you have the internet, but you don't have any, uh, even the device, that is also important. So in, from our university, we have provided um, the laptop for the students, free of cost, and we reduce the, uh, you know, tuition fees waiver, to make sure whether they can get the you know right information from their home, they can use that resources, they can use this device, and they can take the classes. And rather than this, um, uh, health information literacy is in, implanted in our course curriculum, so people will be benefited. Uh, and uh, and one thing is very important that is training for the user. Sometimes maybe you have many resources, but you don't know how to use that, how to find out that information. So we try to give the training for not only only for the resources we also provide uh, uh, how to handle the devices Be because many devices they have a d different technique and such technique is also very important so we are trying to give the uh, techniques to you know uh, how to search the information quickly so all, and from the library some of the library we are providing video conferencing services well, that means maybe you are in the remote area but the library is uh, we have a video conferencing center so we can talk with the remote rural area people and people can be, you know express their health condition the doctor will consult through online so it's it's coming from the library even uh, that uh, you know the women entrepreneurship is very important in our country we are helping especially the rural women to to do their own business so we provide fund for them it's like a loan and and the library is also helping in that case and in our university we have developed a center that is called entrepreneurship center so through that center we are also helping so whatever i'm saying in a uh, in a quick you know quickly i have i think these are the uh, you know all the activities related to goal number four quality education 16 goal number 17 is closely related so we are the LIS professional information professional we are the information scientists we can help to achieve this disease so uh, I think we are the right people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Delara. Delara. I'd now hand over to Winston from New Zealand. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, listening to the listening to the discussion this morning, um, it occurs to me that this is a very multi-stakeholder conversation. This is like the UN only, it's a lot of people on the civil society side talking to one or two people on the UN side, which is a very disappointing imbalance. I would have liked to see a lot more people from the UN side here. Because it is a multi-stakeholder conversation. We, on our side, we have people here who represent government libraries, we represent small community libraries, we represent, uh, we have people who uh, have experience in the business side, the commercial side, uh, from national libraries. But that indicates the vast range of activities and economic and social contributions that libraries make. And I hear you guys from ESCAP, sorry, Jonathan and, and your predecessor, Oliver Patterson, two of you. I heard you both say that you value libraries and you understand the role of libraries, but I'm not convinced that you really, really have an in-depth insight into the whole range of things that the libraries do in our sector. We are involved in, well, first of all, we represent sunk costs in public investment. We take, we take up taxpayers' money. 
we are deeply aware of our moral and, and governmental responsibility to use that money wisely. We don't just free float. We, we actually have a job to do uh, and we have, we're accountable for it. So that's one thing. Um, but then that, that value has to be, as, as Stephen and Weiber and many others have said, has to be represented in the voluntary national reviews. And we are also aware that we have a big job to do to convince our foreign affairs people in our respective countries to understand the role of libraries in contributing to economic development in our countries. And therefore, we have to make sure that they understand it so that it can be fed through into the reports that go to the UN. So uh, again, we are not free floating. We, we are aware of the political importance and impact of the work we do and how it comes across to the people who govern us. We're aware that it has to be defended and unless we can make the impact clear to our authorities, decision makers, policy makers, we cannot um, defend our own position. We have to, we're working with the governments for the benefits of our countries, but we have to make the evidence clear and the impact clear. And I would strongly like to express that libraries cover the full range of activities that the intergovernmental agencies do. We are, I mean, we, we've all mentioned cultural heritage. We've mentioned artificial intelligence. Libraries have been using artificial intelligence for decades. Well, since it really became, you know, common. Um, we've been involved in the internet governance process since that began in 2003, 2005. We were in there right at the beginning, mixing it with the um, other members of the multi-stakeholder community. And every year in this region, when there's an internet governance forum, we organize, uh, contribute to the forums. We organize uh, panels and workshops talking about the role of libraries in publicizing the importance of the internet to provide information services. And equally, um, you know, these, these things overlap, they, they are complementary. But it is very hard for us to see when we organize our uh, workshops on internet governance, it's very hard for us to get the ear of UN uh, agencies in the region. We would like, I'd like just to register that next time we do internet governance work in this region, we would like to hear from SCAP and other people. Uh, we would like to see people from your agencies come and talk in our sessions. I, I think, I think so, I, I, I can see Jonathan taking notes. I'm, I'm, um, <laughs> so, I'm I realize I have to, on, on, on paper by the way as well. Yeah. I cut it short. Um, I think I've made the point. Uh, we are working across a range of issues and talking to a range of agencies. So I would like to, as a final word, just say that the regional division of IFLA is a body within IFLA that I would recommend you talk to frequently. Thank you. Thank you, Winston. And I, I think that actually summarized some of the key points I want to make about, and there's obviously hopefully a conversation that we can continue with, but over to you to sort of summarize a couple of words on what you've heard and any takeaways okay. you have, and then we'll go to our break. Right. Okay. I have a minute. Okay. Uh, three points. Uh, firstly, you know, the, the UN is famous for acronyms, but I, I think we're going to the wrong community, right? You Daisy Starbucks. So I just want to ignore that they're great acronyms, and I think the UN could, could learn a thing or two. But, but, but on a more serious note, I mean, to your point around us, Oliver and I, having in-depth knowledge of what libraries do, we, we listen, we don't. Uh, and, and when I opened up this morning saying, listen, it's the first time we've spoken to this community, <laughs> I, I was being very honest, it, 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 it is. But, but what struck me from what's said today is actually where, where especially, specifically my work rather than um, Oliver's per se, um, we're looking at the same problem and, and, and we're trying to address the same challenges, right? You know, I, I, while I work on government policy, I mean, every, from what I've heard today, 
both bo both of you spoke about inclusion, um, um, digital education. You know, we heard from Guam, where you mentioned digital equity, and I mentioned up front kind of inclusion is at the heart of what we do. This diversity of knowledge, um, which was mentioned as well, uh, and a colleague from New Zealand mentioned multi-stakeholder um, and co um, collaborations that, that need to be part of this conversation. Absolutely agree. And, and again, hearing from Bang, I know Anil child you very well from A to I, and, and just hearing about all your work on digital skills development, supporting women enterprises. These are kind of core areas of things that I work on. So I actually think we're, there is a lot more um uh, uh synergy in the opportunities opportunities we're looking to to exploit and the challenges we're looking to to address now, now, now on your point around kind of engaging scap more in the in these conversations no, no i agree but but equally i think country governments too and i'll give you an example why a lot of my work is supporting governments on digital strategies now this could be anything from i don't know in mongolia we developed their inclusive digital strategy. In Indonesia just recently, we, we developed their digital skills strategy. And you mentioned public funding, and I, I used to work for the Department of Culture in the UK, which looked after libraries, always first when it came to cuts, right? We, 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 all, we all know this. I think how, when you go back to your countries or, or, or provinces or, or municipalities, there's that picture on how libraries can meet these digital skills strategies or support digital transformation that needs to be had because i'll be honest with you very rarely have i seen in a government digital strategy which is predominantly led by a ministry of ict or a, or a department of science and technology in the philippines you have it you know libraries are seen as part of the solution in not all countries there are so so i think the advocacy kind of has to happen on both fronts and of course the un plays a role in this uh, as well in in we don't we don't just kind of draft policy for governments you know we put certain things across like inclusion that we want to address but equally i think there's an onus on all of you as well when when looking at government digital strategies to really think through how libraries can put a really compelling proposition forward to help with digital inclusion and i think there's certainly a narrative there that that can be shaped uh, i'll stop there thank you so much and i think fortunately we have exactly the report for you on that we have a look we've looked through all of the broadband strategies and the digital skills strategies and inventorized where libraries are referenced. So we'll share that because that's a, it's good just to, it's proof of concept. Philippine stars, of course. <laughs> so thank you very much to Jonathan, to Misako, to Elvira. Uh, we'll go to our break now, um, 12, 15 minutes, let's call it. But again, thank you so much, Jonathan. And thank you everyone who spoke. <laughs> I, I promise there'll be fewer British people from now on as well. <laughs> 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 All right, I'm 50 Chinese as well, 50-50. <laughs>
just to leave our island, yeah, just to leave our island and fix the bottom feet out. Just to leave our island because it's crazy. Between the island, it's unreal. Yeah. I want to do it. I want to do it. It's crazy. Do it on it. Yeah. Oh, you do rain out. Or you do out. Oh, so in Papal, excellent, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic, I'm really great to be here, excellent. No, 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 how long have you been here? I think I saw you at the back up there. <laughs> I was trying to work out which chairs were filled, were filled earlier, so I was playing around with them. Excellent, thank you, it's been lovely, everyone's in good mood. Um, yeah, well, it's good, okay, no, no, that's good. I think education is too big in the city. There's so many people involved in education. Yeah, it's good, yeah. So it's good, like, I think we're really getting some good ideas. So this is Sol Irene and Papo from Let's Go Bangkok. Oh, nice to meet you, nice, nice to meet you. Meet you. Yeah. Yeah. We are very pleased that we can be here and the sport we have here is just great, it's wonderful. <laughs> It's been really yeah. nice to yeah. meet you and give you a place to come to see the food for everyone. Wow. So thank you. No, we're looking forward to it. And I think the presentation should be up on the UNESCO yeah. yeah. team the next week. Yeah. So okay. I'm utterly unmanageable to that. <laughs> <laughs> will, will the participants get the slides? So uh, I'm going to ask about that. You know, when, when, I, when I speak about the SDGs and I believe it is quite important what I get that information, yeah. Yeah, yeah, hard yeah. data, yeah. it's really important. And that's also what I was saying. So shocked that 2 billion people without access to information should be there. That shocked me. Now it's 60 million in Vietnam for lots of our houses now, and we need to convert it to make it more transit. So people will have to do that. It's in Germany. Germany's like the Germany's 85. It's 85, so yes. only Turkey is bigger within yes. sister state. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, that would be mega country in Germany. Europe, so it's several it's European countries just yeah. pushing it. Yeah, exactly. So the scale is really yeah. you know, what we're talking about. Scale is huge. And it is, I think, even more diverse than in Europe. Yeah. More than diverse, isn't it? Yeah. The distance is also quite big. <coughs> the distance, we yeah. just heard, we just heard. A 20 hour boat ride was seen as being a short <laughs> between, oh, wow. between, between two aisles, <laughs> just yeah. between two islands. Oh, that's a 20 hour boat ride or 30 minutes flight because of the, the, the draft of the current. The current, the current. The current. The current. The current. So the, he says to, to, move, to move this island to the boat, it's all, already eight hours. Oh, wow. the but the current. water doesn't get run from it. I never would have thought about that. I don't know, we could go from the channel in 90 minutes. And it's called, the Pacific. <laughs> it's called the Pacific, so it should be east. Well, exactly. Yeah, it like it means yeah. east. Yeah, yeah. In Dutch, it is the silent sea, yeah, still yeah. as A. <laughs> so. uh, the Hampshire is the water zone. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I don't think that quite yeah. affects the yeah. current. I think I need some water. No, do you again. I'm, I'm going to go and put yeah. these up on the yeah, thank stage. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got. Um, okay, so we're in Chu and Papun and Papal do to Kai Kayang. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. So, so, so difficult for Kai Nang. No, no, no. Everything that has <laughs> one <laughs> By the time I leave this place, I won't be able to. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's too solid. So, do you have questions? Do you have something to ask? I can't hear all the stuff you can ask. Would you need to just to get to know them? I would hope they need to know you. I don't mind both. I don't mind the culture, actually. Can you do culture, then? I can do this. So, um, so is Unapol uh, has the uh, the other one is called Sol 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 Pasun, which is
So it's the last. It's the last one. Okay, that is the last. I think it, let me give the biographical information now. Let me see if I can introduce her. So you should sit down so you can write this down. I don't think you'll be able to. I can't stop you.
We'll start getting people back into the room. Great. I think almost everyone's back in the room. We'll give 30 seconds. <laughs> Slightly slack timekeeping. <laughs> I apologize for that.
Okay, I think we'll sort of start moving again. So thank you, welcome back for the, the second half of our time here today. So this morning, earlier on, we talked how we had two sessions focusing on... Microphone. Oh, okay. Oh, wow, that's even... Yep, okay. Thank you. I'm going to be repeating this to the panelists as well. I've been asked to. So um, this morning, we talked about the Sustainable Development Goals and technology and innovation. And I think it was a really interesting two-way exchange. I think in each case, we learned a lot from our speakers from UNSCAP. But I really hope, and I saw notes being taken, that they learned a lot about us as a field across the region. And I hope, I don't know, this is just the start of collaboration, both at the regional level, but I think also for yourselves at the national level. Because in I think in all of your countries, I'm not sure if it's 100%, but there's normally a UN resident coordinator, someone who is there looking to carry out programs, projects, initiatives, where there's a possibility to make UN goals, to deliver on UN goals on the ground. The second half of our program is focused on UNESCO. Um, I'm sure UNESCO needs no introduction to all of you. It is the UN agency that has basically three core library missions in its name, being education, science, communication, and, and culture. Um, so I think we're not going to have any difficulty finding overlap here. I think what will be interesting, just as in the first session, is to hear about the specifics of what UNESCO's Bangkok is working on, and for you in turn to share what you're working on, and hopefully we can catalyze further collaborations, further initiatives together. So this first session of the two is going to focus on the topic of education and lifelong learning. We know we did the survey yesterday, we asked which SDG are you working on most? SDG 4 comes out as, I think, I think only one person in this room didn't say they were working on SDG 4. I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up, but I think you can take it as a, a given that <laughs> pretty well everyone in this room is working on SDG 4 as a matter of priority. So the will is there, the action is there. It'll just be interesting to, to, to bring it together. So to introduce, we have two great colleagues from the UNESCO's Bangkok office. The Bangkok office is the education lead for the region. So they're not just focusing on Thailand, they really are focusing on, on all of the countries here. So I think there's really interesting possibilities for overlap. So we have Sorin, uh, Sorin Chuan Prapun, um, and she is the team lead for literacy and lifelong learning at UNESCO Bangkok. She promotes education for marginalized children, youth and adults. Um, for, and she's been doing this for over seven years. She's promoting these things, so literacy and lifelong learning especially through innovation and educational technology. She's going to be talking about the programming there. We also have Papal Duti Priya Duti Krai Kriang. I hope I got, I've been practicing this in my head. Um, um, Papal is a national project, project officer at UNESCO Bangkok. So Thai colleagues, definitely interesting to talk to as well. Um, he's had a range of roles within the UN from, and, uh, uh, from being a project officer since this year at UNESCO Bangkok. He's also worked at UNOPS, at UNHCR, the High Commission for Refugees, at ESCAP, and also at the Japanese International Cooperation Agency. And he spent some time in Japan as well, so it could be an interesting contact for you, Ms. Ako, too. So we will then have our two library speakers. So we have uh, Do Miatsan from Myanmar, and we have Labiba Zain from Indonesia. And I think that Irshad is also going to join us shortly up there. But over to our UNESCO colleagues first. So in Apple. Oh, thank you so much, Stephen, for a very nice introduction. And also, I'm very pleased to be here with you all today with my colleagues, Papon from UNESCO Bangkok. And I'm really glad to hear that all of you have SDG4 uh, in your heart. So today, uh, let me just uh, show you some examples, of our um, kind of national examples that we have been implementing and also promoting the government um, in several countries uh, to translate SDG4 into actions. And uh, I must say that I um, also come from uh, education, uh, innovation and skills development section. So as Stephen mentioned, uh, all the projects that we have been doing, we have been trying to to make an effort and try to harness uh, the use of ICT and also technology in order to serve 
uh, the underserved people and also children and youth in this region. So uh, today I would like to show you, um, together with my colleague, uh, three examples from, from our team. The first one, uh, it's called Learning Coin. Um, you may wonder what is Learning Coin uh, is about. It's actually the initiative that we are trying to address the issues of our school children and youth in this region. So even before the pandemic, there are 127 million children and young people who are not going to school in this region, in Asia and the Pacific. So you can imagine that this is already a half of the world's our school children and youth. So this is a big number and the situation is very, very critical. And uh, after the pandemic, we estimate that 4% of school children in Asia and the Pacific will be at risk of dropping out of school. So the situation will only continue to exacerbate. So this way, uh, as UNESCO, we try to, to help uh, this last 5% of the children who are not going to school to be able to be motivated and go back to school. So we come up with this uh, learning coin model. Uh, actually, it starts from our conversation um, with some group of our school children and youth in Thailand. And we were asking them actually, like, why are you not going to school? So we just asked them this simple question. And then we were very shocked and so surprised um, that many of them said that they feel guilty of going to school. And you know why? Um, the reason why they feel so bad of going to school is because they say that if they're going to school, while their parents are working very hard to make this family thrive, then how come? How can I go to school and see our parents working hard like that? So that's why at the age of uh, 11 or 12, or especially during their uh, lower secondary education, they tend to drop out. We have like significant rate uh, of dropout rate um, in this region. So that's why we said, uh, as a UNESCO team, we, we, we are thinking like, how can we motivate them to still you know, retain in the education system while they can also financially help their families. So we come up with this uh, learning coin model. Basically, we identify our school children or those who are at risk of dropping out. And then we ask them to read, read books as many as they could on our application platform, which is called Learn Big. So as you are all librarians, um, UNESCO developed these digital platforms uh, with lots of support from libraries and publishers. We have this application Learn Big, uh, which um, provides nearly 2,000 books uh, contributed by publishers and libraries, um, especially in Thailand and also in Myanmar, because we simply we, we target migrant children and also our school children in Thailand, including those who come from Myanmar, which uh, we have quite numbers of uh, populations in Thailand. So we identify uh, these children and ask them to read and once they start reading then our system the learn big system will record all their reading behaviors so this means that uh, we record the number of hours that they read how consistently they read and also each book after they finish they will also have to answer the questions uh, to each book and then the teachers they will monitor the reading progress uh, at the back end system. Um, and it's an online monitoring system which can um, analyze the data real time. So teachers can really track the progress of the students and they can also approve and review the answers submitted by the students. And this way, these three criteria, uh, we calculate the reading efforts in each month and turn it into scholarships. So in fact, uh, our students, the learning con students, if they read a lot, then it's very simple. They will earn a lot of scholarships and they can utilize this scholarship to uh, support their families or give it to their parents or even uh, support their, their school fees and etc. So this is some kind of 
uh, motivation, um, engagement, uh, rating engagement, and also uh, incentivization uh, for our school children and youth in Thailand that we are trying to do uh, currently with the Equitable Education Fund uh, of the government of Thailand uh, with just only 500 students now, but we aim to expand this initiative more and more. So I'm talking about uh, the Learn Big application. Um, today, uh, I also would like to also ask for your support uh, because this Learn Big platform, um, it's available uh, on our website, uh, worldwebblearnbig.net, and also applications on Google Play Store and also App Stores. Uh, these are all free open platforms. And we developed this one simply because we want our school children along the Thai Myanmar border and uh, beyond uh, can benefit from free resources and quality reading materials. So if all of you have the content that are specifically um, could be appropriate for children and youth, then as so your NASCO team, we would be really, really appreciate if you can contribute your contents to us. And then we can uh, disseminate this content more and more to our school children. And during this time, since I have my colleague from Myanmar here, uh, we know that the situation on the border is really severe. And, and we observe that um, there are more and more users and learners from Myanmar who have been benefiting from the Learn Big platform because schools are not operational and then people would like to seek more content and school simply stop and learning cannot be disrupted so learn big can serve as one of the channels uh, that can help uh, the students in Myanmar access to textbooks and many, many books in Burmese, and also students on the border as well. And since now we also have the situation of in the influx uh, from Myanmar to Thailand. So we try to utilize this LearnBig platform to, to benefit uh, the students uh, who take refuge uh, into Thailand as well. And the second initiative um, following uh, the platform of Learn Big that I uh, introduced earlier, um, we also have the online course on uh, community learning centers and lifelong learning. Uh, that might be of your interest um, because this online course basically um, a consolidation of all the modules are related to lifelong learning and community-based education. So this might be of your interest since you uh, work uh, together uh, with uh, so many community-based uh, organizations and local stakeholders. Um, so with this uh, online course, uh, if you can finish uh, 11 modules uh, in three hours, um, you can learn uh, the foundation of adult learning and education, community-based education, and also lifelong learning. So we try to make it very simple. And if you complete this course, you can also receive the certificate uh, from UNESCO Bangkok. And uh, to date, uh, we have quite a number of users and also viewers. We already reached like 1.7 million views of this course and uh, many certificates have been generated already. So yeah, we just want to promote this course uh, with all of you if you can um, uh, think of this one uh, as uh, some kind of um, um, the online course uh, when you think about lifelong learning or community-based education. So now uh, I would like to, to pass uh, on to my uh, colleague Papon to talk about our new website and also our initiative on equitable education, which is very important issue and very much related to SDG4. Thank you very much, Thawirin. Okay, thank you very much. So having the SDG4 as the guiding principle, our lifelong learning team at UNESCO Bangkok is implementing the regional promotion of equitable education through innovation project phase two. And the main objective of this project is to support uh, our donor, uh, Equitable Education Fund Thailand, known as EEF, to promote equitable education for marginalized and dis disadvantaged children, and to disseminate practical exercise and expertise information to put the initiative into practice. So as you see on the screen here is the uh, screenshot of the main webpage of our website. And we officially launched this Equitable Education Hub, known as Equity Ed Hub, uh, earlier this year. And this website will serve as a one-stop shop for equitable education initiatives. And I would like to highlight some of the key functions of the website here, is that uh, the knowledge tab that you see is a 
have this uh, as a digital library uh, worth uh, worth up about five years of curated articles up at uh, on equitable education in different fields, including edtech, distant learning, gender disparity, education in emergencies, and SEL, and so on. So this is the uh, website that we would like all learners from not just in the region but all around the world to come in and uh, enjoy the contents that we provide on equitable education. And another uh, tab that I would like to highlight is the toolboxes that I'm sure um, some of the presenter mentioned earlier that they also have a toolbox. Uh, we have that too. and. We uh, this toolbox serves as a platform that you can share your pedagogical work and successes to our website, and we as key resources, and we will we can also promote that on the website as well. And um, online course that my colleague Sovereign mentioned, it can also be found here in this link. And also, I would like to flag that our team is also producing another online course on equitable education consisting of 10 modules. And the course will be launched in earlier next year in February. And that is free of access and will, learners from around the world will receive certificates when they complete the course. And um, I will quickly go through this uh, another tab called the Equitable Education Alliance, known as EEA. And this is one of the bigger initiatives that we are working with our donor and the working group. So what is EEA? EEA is a community of practitioners consisting of um, UN agencies, Ministry of Education, NGO, CBOs, and stakeholders who strives to push for a more inclusive and equitable educational system to enhance the performance of existing initiative at all levels, like regional, local, and international. So EEA was established in 2020, and as of now, we have 16 countries and 20 international organizations as the official members, and that include the Ministry of Education from several countries in the region, UNICEF, um, not just in Thailand, and UNICEF um, Panama, UNICEF uh, EAPRO, and we also have the World Bank, GPE, and OECD, and so on. And the goal of the alliance is to improve the regional and international cooperation in raising the issue of educational inequity. And we are doing this by um, exchanging and disseminating information to obtain the most up-to-date knowledge of practices, program, and promising cases related to equity in education. And the launching of the website is one of the main reasons that we are having this alliance it, that the website will serve as a knowledge hub for learners from around the world. And we are also trying to enhance the institutional capacity of member organizations to promote equity-based education for country that would like to also establish this kind of alliance in their own country. We can also provide technical support for them. And we would like to strengthen the partnerships and innovation learning systems. And by doing so, we would like to establish this in all levels among governments, private sector, and international agencies, and also developing joint actions. And uh, how are we doing this? Or how do we uh, achieve all the goals? So the Alliance convened two meetings per year. And the most recent meeting that we had was uh, the fifth meeting of Equitable Education Alliance, uh, which was organized in Bangkok uh, in October. And there were a total of 12 countries and 10 organizations participating to identify the main obstacle for implementing uh, equitable education and how do we resolve all the blockages in the region. Because um, we have been working about two decades now and the progress in the region is, um, like my colleague mentioned, is very slow, especially because of COVID. And um, the members gather to also identify expertise and among members to explore a collaboration opportunities and towards equity in education. And right now, UNESCO Bangkok and uh, EEF Thailand serve as the secretaries of this alliance. And that would be the end of our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, so and thank you, Papo. I think I'm sure there's lots of, I don't know, I saw that the cameras keep on coming up to take photos of those slides. I'm sure if it's possible to share them, if you give permission, some of yes. those links. Sure. And I think out of interest in the Equitable Education Alliance, it's a member state coalition or it's member states and stakeholders? Um, we we uh, accept um, international organizations, Ministry of Education, so it doesn't have to be state. So it could be it like be yeah, okay. private sector as well. Pri yeah. Okay, so so okay, non government mm. also works. Okay, yeah. interesting. Regional office, take note. <laughs> um, so before I'm, I, I was saying there'd be fewer British, there'd be less British, so I'm going to speak less now. Um, we're great, glad to have the, a couple of our, our our participants have agreed to speak here as well. 
So first of all, I'd like to hand over to Dor Miatsan from Myanmar to talk a little bit about some of the really good work done, especially with school libraries in Myanmar. Yes. Good morning, and IFLA presidents, uh, Ms. Barbara Lissens, and Stephen, Esther, Christina, and team, and UN ESCAT UNESCO team, uh, and our fellow librarians. Uh, I would like to say thank you for organizing this uh, very unique workshop and meeting. And on behalf of Myanmar Library Associations, I'd like to present the success activities of the association. This is the first time that MLA are able to take part in the IFLA UN meeting. We are in a great honor for that, proud to present, share our great success. School libraries in Myanmar are less developed in most of the schools. We face many challenges in promotions of readership in the school libraries. And there are 47,000 libraries in Myanmar, public libraries in Myanmar. And most of the public schools libraries are in poor shape. And situations in high school is a little bit better. Uh, let's see our challenges. Library is considered as less item of the school priority list. Most of the school libraries are open during the only vacant hour of the teacher librarians. Some school had a space, some don't. The collections were small and outdated, very difficult to use the collections. There are no professional librarians. Emily believes there is an urgent need to transform school libraries into environment conducive for learning and promote reading habit. Emily recommends the steps of development of school libraries in the country. Since 2015, Emily has initiated the pilot project, Re-Energizing School Libraries, funded by the Asia Foundation. We transformed 10 school libraries from six regions and states into vital learning space with welcoming environment for both teachers and students. After our pilot project, funded by the Isha Foundation, the evaluation results is very important for defining MLA future direction in working with the school libraries. Let's move to the six steps of implementing the project effectively. As a step one, after the meeting with the Minister of Education, we received the funding from MOE, we organized two days workshop with the Township Education Officer, TEO, principals and two teachers, we introduced the project and they shared the library education. It's great involvement in ownership by the TEO partners who are the most important key players in the project. TEO's partners involving them from the start in the workshops have made a difference. And involving the principals in the workshop was a good move as well. So step two, we organized the trainers workshop with the volunteer librarians from university, public and community. We equipped the teacher librarians with basic skills of library management, cataloging, classification, circulation, how to develop the library collection, etc. Step four, at the peer learning meeting with the university librarians, community and public librarians who implemented the project in the front row, we discuss does responsibility and library routing work, library rules, care of books, print rich and community engagement program among them, and discuss challenges and opportunities, how to solve the issues and overcome it. Step five, after library setup with the library furniture, supplies, new books, wall painting, and the library was well used, monitoring and evaluation is used to assess the performance of the project. Step six, final step, we submit the final report to the Ministry of Education, Department of Basic Education. During the political changes and COVID crisis, MLA and volunteer librarians managed to work online via Facebook group, Fiverr group, and telephone conversation for the training. We collaborate with the caring partners such as the Myanmar Book Aids and Preservation Foundation, Yoma Bank, and some publishers for getting new books. And also thanks to the courier service, MGL Express, they send the books, library supplies free of charge to the school libraries around the country. And let's move to the success. 
the principals, teachers, librarians, parents, and community members, and also school alumni students share the sense of ownership in the library. The attitudes of the TEO, Township Education for Officers, have totally changed after the project. TEOs always occupy with many educational activities in the township. They are now passionate and given the first priority to organize the school library, collect the new schools, decorate the school library with beautiful interior design and wall painting, etc. And we could arrange the library period schedule time for children. And they can read, they can check out books during the library period. And government budget increase for purchasing books monthly basis from US dollar around 20 to US dollar 100 per month. The ministry funded around US dollar 2,500 for book procurement, furniture, library supplies to each project site school libraries. Library programs, which includes in orientation session, library tour, group discussion, best library user awards are arranged. The, here are the benefits of school libraries success of students. Children read more and more at home and at school as well. They have confidence in talking about his or her favorite book at the assembly every weekly basis and socializing in the library. Uh, like uh, older students have the uh, younger students for the choice of the books in the library and more achievements and like a competitions of story telling, essay writing, print rich competition, reading uh, practice. And this is the learning place for the, like a behavior change is the most important act. And also the, we help boost confidence to talk in the public area and like, we, great, we are great to see the involvement of the university librarians, public and community librarians together for sustaining the school library. They have become institutionalized. How should we improve in the near future? It would be very effective if sustainable plan for e-schools, like a sustainability guidelines or roadmaps. And positions of qualified librarians should be created and to be appointed. And we should, find, we should find the good ways to get new books annually. And we would like to equip hardware and software in the library to integrate new technologies in the library, like a Sukoha software. We expand the library models to other schools where they are confident that the school will adopt that model. Thank you so much for inviting me to share our knowledge. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Domiad. Thank you. No, I, I think it was really powerful, firstly, that the cooperation between different library types. And I know we've done our own workshop. We'll talk a little bit more about how you ensure sustainability, yes. but also that focus on the sustainability roadmap. The world is full of pilot projects, mm -hmm. which then stop. <laughs> and so actually having that plan for systematizing things is actually sure. super important. Sure, so sure. thank you. Thank so you. now I will turn over to Labiba, and I think Irshad will then join from the floor. Labiba, over to you. And I, I should say, I've been told, like I'm failing to do so, speak into the microphone. <laughs> OK, thank you, Stephen. Hello, everybody. I'm Labiba Zain from uh, Indonesia. Um, I will uh, talk about uh, lifelong uh, uh, learnings. Um, Indonesia, community uh, literacy has become national agenda of uh, Indonesia. It is stated that uh, it is stated in the seventh development agenda of the national medium term plan in 2020 and 2024 actually national library of indonesia through a national development project and quality of social inclusion inclusion based libraries and building community empowerment through the transformation of social inclusion based library uh, 
when we talk about uh, social inclusion based library transformation it's mean uh, the goal is improving the quality of information services through computer uh, book and internet facilitate activities according to community needs and cooperate with other parties to get support uh, it must include and uh, reach the involve of the community involving group of people with disabilities the elderly people women and others that have never been reached before and uh, we have to appreciate uh, uh, diversity and uh, if we talk the midterm development plan 2020-2024 national priority called mental revolution and cultural uh, development priority uh, programs including improving uh, literacy culture developing a reading habit book system development and literacy contents increasing access and quality uh, social in inclusion based uh, library uh, development guidance and protection of indonesian uh, racial language and uh, script as well as uh, literature because we have a lot of uh, local language and if we don't preserve the local language will uh, fade away uh, straight, uh, strengthening social institution at the drive uh, literacy and innovation including library partner development social innovation development supported by uh, donor and uh, philanthropy uh, funding. Uh, we used to have a Coca-Cola Foundation uh, to support uh, the, the program of National Library uh, relating to uh, social uh, inclu inclusion. Uh, the, the library provides education material yes, in, uh, accessible to blind people in a library in Malang. At university level, UIN Sunan Kalijaga Library provide book for blind and sign language training, and they can uh, access preaching ceremony in the Friday prayer, Friday prayer using sign language. So if you come to UIN Sunan Kalijaga Mosque, uh, deaf student can still know what the religious preacher said due to sign language interpreter. Because in Muslims, we have uh, if we we pray and we didn't hear what the priest said so uh, it's not accepted <laughs> so uh, it is uh, very interesting uh, when uh, sunan kalijaga also provide diva repositories uh, so that the blind student can access library book from anywhere it helps during covid and during pandemic region library of uh, sleman organized a story class uh, for the student using instagram uh, for young people who cannot continue their higher education, the village library provides training on graphic design, video making, and digital marketing. So some of them has been become content writer. Uh, training on health also done by libraries in cooperation with health community centers. Training on creative uh, writing and also preserving culture has been done by village libraries in Yogyakarta, uh, the society who uh, took the training, including person with disability, they learn how to play traditional mu music and dance. So once there is cultural event, they can perform in this occasion. By this long life, uh, education library can uh, pow power uh, the society. So uh, actually, I have a lot of uh, picture relating uh, what the library done. This is online marketing in the Nglanggeran village library, graphic design training at the post uh, in the uh, in the Kepe village, computer training for small, small and medium uh, agency at the Petir village library. Training on making short film and videos at the Petir, also Petir uh, Library. Uh, we have reading club at uh, Gunung Kidul Regency Library and Archive Service. Writing, uh, creative writing training for the state civil uh, uh, people in the uh, Gunung Kidul Regency. We have a webinar during pandemic, a lot of webinar with professional organization. Uh, relating to health uh, and also uh, COVID. We have English club 
in Pengkol uh, Village Library and writing lesson for young for young student uh, for for the young people at the Sambirajo uh, Village Library. So basically, we have a society. We have society. We have library and quality of education and quality life. If the society access the library, it will increase the quality of life. Thank you so much. I will pass Thank to Ed Irshad too. Indeed, Irshad. Okay. Assalamualaikum. Good afternoon. Thank you, Stephen and Labiba. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Irshad from Indonesia. Allow me to deliver you about Indonesia library and of course SDGs. Like Labiba said before, in the first time in Indonesia history, library and literacy mentioned directly in our five-year national development plan 2019 till 2024 and become national priority. In Indonesia, through the national library, we claim that the library support all SDGs. A bold move indeed, none other than to attract the eyes, the eyes of local government and other stakeholders to see the library. So they have a wide range of options for involving libraries in what areas suit their, their resources. The contact of course remains on the library as an institution providing information and knowledge. So library are a gateway for people to understand SDGs and how to achieve them. That's why we started at the Fields Library. Started in thousands of Fields Libraries, yes, thousands, because like Stephen said before, we have six figure of library in Indonesia, uh, more than 160,000 library. Okay. Because we see the Phyllis Library as the closest library to the community and certainly has the potential to be the most inclusive place to visit in village. And Phyllis Library, we think is simple to set up but very impactful. We provide them with adequate library collection and ICT support for library services. We also do capacity building for librarians in the village library so that good facilities can be met with a great librarians. With that, we hope that the community can continue to develop themselves through the use of the village library. So uh, in context of lifelong learning so that people in the village library do not stop learning after completing their basic education or even their uh, dropping out from their basic education, which in the end become a leverage for Indonesia in achieving SDGs. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Irshad. No, I love that, the way you described the role of the village libraries as a really omnipresent, sorry, complicated word, a network that is everywhere and that has such huge potential and can deliver on so many different areas. We talked a little bit this morning about the concept of development accelerators as a response to bottlenecks in development and that and there's so much space that if children don't go to people don't go to school, if they don't have access to information, that is a bottleneck. But even a small village library with the relevant support can unblock the bottleneck and therefore become a development accelerator. Um, we've got six minutes. I think we'll run until 12 on this one. Um, I was going to open the floor. If there's anyone else who would like to talk a little bit about the role of your libraries and your countries in promoting education and lifelong learning, whether you can see any potential overlap or potential for collaboration with some of the initiatives set out by colleagues at UNESCO Bangkok, where you've done similar things to that that what's been that that has been done in Myanmar and Indonesia. Any hands up? Oh, fantastic! P Peter was first, and then Omida. So we'll do two. So we have from the Pacific and from Uzbekistan. Peter. Oh, assalamualaikum. Uzbekistan dem kutphanelarde asosan osha yirik oblis kutphanelarde bugun gikunde yoshlar ge qaratligan talim boichi judayam koplay xalamal gosherliyapte. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Right. So it means you know even in our Uzbekistan, we are from Uzbekistan. In our Uzbekistan, even in big regions, also we have got many libraries, big libraries. 
Uzbekistan'da bürüz 30'dan artık millet ve elitler istikamet kıladı. Actually in Uzbekistan there are 130 nationalities live in Uzbekistan. Judeyam kop ahırge payette kutuphanelerge müracaatlar bol yaptı yaşlar tamamen türlü tillerini organiş boyunca. And thus you know most of you know nationalities they want to have you know books in different languages. Tillerini organiş boyunca kutuphana mutakaysilere türlü uşa taşken şahırda ama Uzbekistan'da joylaşken halkara taşkilatlar bilen, elçhaneler bilen bir gelikti. So that's why you know Librarians from Uzbekistan, from the Tashkent, and from other provinces, they are contacting the embassies and then different, you know, international organizations in order to get books. And then even in libraries, we have got, you know, special courses free. By the way, free special courses for on different languages. Bu fakat kendi taşkendeymez, belki başka regionlarımızda, yani Samarkand, Bukhara, Xorazm, yeri kütüphanelerde ham mesele var. Şu plan bir gelikte. It's it's not even in our capital Tashkent, but it is all over the Tash Uzbekistan in other provinces as well. Kütüphaneciler tamamdan uzları, o şey türlü türlü organ iş boyutu, farklı konversasyon kulüpler, az gavurdun kulüpler. And our librarians, you know, most of them they speak different, can speak their different language, so that's why they're trying to make, you know, clubs, conversation clubs in different languages for free. Yeah, yeah. 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 And another big project uh, for from our country in uh, big our in our big library. So they're inviting the elder people, like after six, you know, who are already in pension. So they're inviting them to come and then read books and study and get some knowledge in, in computer sciences. So they can use the technology. Bu judeam ulege yaqte bu nukul bernichil na merot kuzamas, chunki jude kub chilene bugunju kunda bu niyashar shkerekmas farzantlar. Tun dünyaya tar kalıp gitkende, ulabla alaka kılış, oşe internet or kalı alaka kılış cüdeye muhüm xsabla nede? And they had very good response from you know elderly people from all over Uzbekistan because most of the youth like in every country you know right now after they graduate from university they're trying to get good jobs from different other countries and it was a little bit bit problem for elder people because they couldn't use the new technology. Like using the Skype or other things. So right now they have learned this thing, and then they can communicate freely with their own children. And they're uh, thanking, you know, Library of Uzbekistan for that. Şuna göre loyhalarımız var. Biz talim ge, cüdeyim. Kol biz fakat ki ne imkanet çıkılanlar gibi, alakda yönelişlerimiz var. Talim boyunca. And then we have got special projects for people with disabilities as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think that that underlines that point about well, once people have left school, where's the go-to place for education? And you have this fantastic, strong network in so many of our countries ready to do that. Peter. Yeah, thanks, uh, Stephen. I'm uh, an agriculture information and knowledge management specialist. Um, primarily working in the Pacific Islands. And I was provoked to say something listening to our colleague from Indonesia talking about the, uh, the community libraries and things like that. A long while ago, I was uh, working with, closely with ministries of agriculture and they, they complained all the time about people going into villages and talking to their farmers about doing, you know, doing something with agricultural crops or whatever and telling them the wrong thing. And I said, well, if they're in the villages, that means they have access. Why aren't you giving them the right information when they go into the village? And that comes back then to the whole essence that, that uh, a point of contact, whether it's a community library or a school library, is so essential to what we're doing. I mean, we spend a lot of time talking about websites, and sorry to say, it's talking about websites and mobile platforms and all the rest of it, but in the end, in villages and districts and that, that's not where people are going. So we need to have uh, to use that uh, conduit to 
disseminate information and also to gain feedback on the kinds of things that people are interested in. If we're involved in, a, in trying to attain the SDGs, then we must be involved at the, at the grassroots level. And we can't be everywhere, therefore we need partners, therefore we need to uh, uh, take on board existing networks and everything. So working with and through others is a key part of what we're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. And I think, you know, I'm sure everyone's here, you won't, there's a, a massively overquoted librarian in the US called David Lankews, whose line is, I know, a bad library creates collections, a good library creates services, a great library creates communities. And which I think tallies with this idea that, I don't know, just the information or just the tool is not enough. It's having the people and the place that makes a difference. You saw the other session, so you know I'm going to ask uh, Sawirin and, and, and Papal to, to say one or to give one or two minutes of just summing up on your reflections, and then we'll move on to the next panel. So Sawirin, Papal. Well, thank you so much. And um, I learned so much from this floor and really appreciate your, your comments and also insights. Yes, I think, um, because I have been working like together with my team uh, through the community learning centers. Uh, in, in this region, we have um, more than 300,000 uh, community learning centers or CLCs um, at the very grassroots levels. So these learning centers serve as libraries and they also serve as knowledge hub, a skills development hub, as well as income generating hub for people at the grassroots levels. So what we do is try to support them um, because we, we know that the, the government um, unfortunately um, spent very minimal funding on adult learning and education and lifelong learning. Actually, this the, the figure is quite shocking because nearly half of the countries worldwide only spent uh, less than 1% on adult learning and education and lifelong learning. So I, I must say that we need a lot of investment in, in this uh, area. If we want to promote uh, more roles of libraries, uh, more roles of community-based uh, learning centers, and also try to help people to, to reskill and also upskills. And for, for their, the purpose is for their lifelong learning and also for their employability and quality of life. So we, we must uh, emphasize uh, to, to the governments that we really need uh, more investment in, in this area. And I think the, the collaboration that all of you have is very meaningful. And also, uh, if we can do, or as UNESCO, we will always try to continue to advocate for the government to support you and also give more funding and give more priorities uh, to libraries and also community-based learning centers. Thank you. Um, I think my colleague covered everything, so I'll just say that um, thank you for having us today, and we will use what we learned today and, and incorporate that into the work that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. No, and I think, so just a final word for me, I know you've talked about community learning centers, big C, big L, big C. But I think from what we've heard, libraries are community learning centers, little C, little L, little C already. So there's so much opportunity to bring these two worlds together more effectively. So thank you very much. Thank you to Sorin, to Papal, to Dormiat, uh, to Dormiat San, and to Labiba, to Irshad for your words, to Amida, to Peter. Thank you. So now we'll move on to our final session. And I'm actually going to ask Ntabi to come moderate this one in my commitment to less British. <laughs> and she gets a, one of these, which will make the photos better. Don't knock it over, Ntabi. For once I felt tall in my life because I had a ball. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, now you're gonna hear a very African voice. <laughs> I am Tabiseng Kotokwani. I am from South Africa. And I work for the University of Free State in Free State. And 
I'm a chair of the IFLA Regional Council. So I'm happy to be here and have be in this uh, session for the Asia and Oceania region. I know yes, uh, yesterday everyone was asking me, what are these regions? What, what do I mean? I'm the chair of the, of the regional council. So there is the six regions, <laughs> uh, which I always forget, and Stephen always reminds me. It's the America, which is Canada and the US, Latin America and Oceania, uh, Latin America and, and the Caribbean. <laughs> And then there is Europe, Africa, in Africa it is MENA region, and Sub-Saharan Africa, and Asia, and Oceania. I got them right this time. So those are the regions. So I chair the council of all the chairs of these regions. So I'm really happy to be with you here and to have the um, the opportunity to discuss the issues that are in Asia and Oceania. And I hope you will learn a lot from this session and take it back to your countries, because that's what we want. And for UNESCO, I hope you will have good uh, points that you can take, and then you collaborate with the libraries because we always say that libraries are at the ground and libraries are at the grassroots level. Libraries are out there in the community. I heard about the community centers. So when you plan anything, remember you have libraries that have access to the community and they will be there to be your running mates people that have access to the uh, community and they can repackage the information in a way that the community can understand. Not only, we, we believe in websites, we believe in technology. Yes, COVID has helped us. Everybody now has access to technology, but there are still people who, who, do, who don't have access. Thank you. So back to this session. I would like to ask my speakers, uh, Montera and Tania and Botaka from Kazakhstan to come up to the stage. Oh, I have my other. So Montera is already on the stage. This session is on cultural heritage. This is my favorite uh, topic. <laughs> so the first speaker is, please forgive me for butchering your names. I apologize in advance. It's Montera Nako. She is um, a cultural program officer in UNESCO. She manages various projects in UNESCO, safeguarding and um, cultural heritage and also responsible for sustainable development of cultural her heritage and world heritage. And also in, she's, her, she's involved in capacity building um, program we've just heard about uh, education so that's part of it and sustainable tourism and collection management uh, for UNESCO I will give over to you to talk to us thank you um, good good morning um, and thank you very much madam chair and to IFLA for giving UNESCO the opportunity to join you today we're delighted to um, be able to share some of the work that we do in the area of cultural heritage as it's related to sustainable development goals and sustainability more broadly. 
and we'd be very eager to explore uh, venues and possibilities to work more closely with libraries. Uh, libraries um, um, in many places um, house not only um, um, sort of contemporary publications, but also perhaps in some cases also even um, um, heritage in the form of documentary heritage. And we know, for instance, from Mali, UNESCO has been involved very much in saving um, um, historic library collections um, from some of um, the, uh, the um, circumstances over the last few years. And so I think um, there's a very close uh, overlap between the work of um, uh, librarians, uh, people who manage those collections, and, and the cultural heritage work that we do. So I'd like to share with you um, a little bit more uh, in terms of exactly what we do. So um, the uh, the um, topic I would like to speak to you about today is heritage and sustainability. And um, by this point, and also, you know, based on all of the work that, that you've been doing um, um, in your own particular libraries and countries, you know, everyone is, is more than familiar with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. But the question is, how do these goals intersect with things that perhaps uh, were not obvious um, in the past? Um, some of uh, you may remember that the precursor of the Sustainable Development Goals was the Millennium Development Goals. And it had a number of overlapping priorities, so poverty, hunger, um, education, and so forth. But those who are familiar with the Millennium Development Goals will also recall that in fact, culture was barely mentioned at all. Heritage was barely mentioned at all in the Millennium Development Goals. And so in a sense, the Sustainable Development Goals being more encompassing, uh, provide us an opportunity to finally link in an explicit manner the issue of culture with the issue of sustainability as a kind of global commitment by governments, um, by private sector um, entities, um, by civil society organizations, and by communities as well. And so in, in doing so, um, the Sustainable Development Goals takes two um, positions about heritage and sustainability. On the one hand, yes, there is the important task of sustaining and preserving the heritage resources as such. And by heritage resources, you know, we could mean a historic building, um, uh, an ancient landscape, uh, a waterway system, uh, uh, textile weaving, um, basketry, uh, food traditions, and so forth. So everything that spans the gamut between heritage that you can touch as well as heritage, which uh, is, um, um, in what we call intangible, um, that encompasses uh, the work that UNESCO does in the area of heritage. Um, and so here we have an explicit reference for the first time um, in a global agenda um, in the form of SDG target 11.4, which specifically talks about the need to protect and to safeguard the world's cultural and natural heritage. And if we have any colleagues joining us today from Vietnam, you will um, perhaps uh, recall this image, it's from the ancient town of Hoi An, which is in the middle of Vietnam and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. At the same time, what's interesting is that the Sustainable Development Goals also provide the room to link heritage into the larger agenda for sustainable development. And so in this case, it's not just this, you know, protecting heritage for the sake of protecting heritage, but it's also how do we mobilize heritage for sustainable development? Uh, and we know that in many cases, you know, truly sustainable development uh, is based on a, a deep understanding of people's culture and traditions and so forth. And so in that sense, heritage and culture can be uh, cross-linked to many of the sustainable development goals. And in fact, we could say even all. So UNESCO has done a mapping based on the voluntary national reviews, which are the reports that are submitted by various governments to um, explain how they've been implementing the sustainable development goals in their own countries. And based on this report, based on um, uh, evidence that has been provided by various United Nations member states, we've been able to do a mapping of exactly how culture can contribute to the 17 sustainable development goals. So for instance, we can see under SDG 2 on the issue of sustainable um, uh, agriculture, um, on the issue of food, no, um, no hunger. 
um, that local and indigenous knowledge can contribute to sustainable agricultural practices. Uh, and uh, even say SDG number seven, uh, we can also see that you know energy consumption patterns are very much uh, influenced um, by cultural norms and behaviors. And so this is very timely following on the COP27 um, summit that was just conducted um, in Cairo. Um, and at the same time, there's also other aspects as well in terms of protecting life on land, protecting life on water. These are some of the more obvious links to uh, culture and, and heritage as well. And so if we zoom in on a few particular um, goals and targets, um, my colleagues just now mentioned um, the connection between um, education and sustainable development. So under target 4.7, um, it talks about not only the need for children to you know, uh, be able to read and write, but it also talks about the need for, for children as well as all learners, um, irregardless of age, uh, to be able to um, develop other skill sets related to sustainable development, such as um, an understanding about human rights, um, the promotion of the culture of peace, an appreciation for cultural diversity. And it's, it's these types of so-called maybe soft skills, shall we say, which are really uh, instrumental in ensuring that we can live together peacefully and work together toward a sustainable future. At the same time, uh, culture and heritage can also contribute to um, jobs. Uh, so under SDG target 8.3, we have a linkage with um, culture, heritage, as well as policies for decent jobs and entrepreneurship. An example we have, for instance, again, from Vietnam, by coincidence, uh, UNESCO has been working very actively in uh, promoting the cultural enterprises, uh, as well as the creative industries in Vietnam. And following COVID, actually, this has been an area that has seen quite a lot of interest, particularly as it engages with um, youth, uh, young entrepreneurs, and so forth, who are able to, you know, find creative ways of packaging goods and services um, for, um, for, for sale. Um, and I'm sure that libraries are an important place where they can um, seek inspiration for some of their thoughts. Target 13.1. Um, which uh, refers to resilience to climate related disasters. Here again, we can see the importance of indigenous and local knowledge, for instance, in the construction of um, places for refuge during cyclones. And this is an example of a UNESCO project that was done in Vanuatu, where we looked at the role of uh, local architecture uh, to help in fact protect people during times of, um, of crisis. And so here again, uh, the linkage with libraries as repositories of this kind of knowledge uh, and places where such documentation can be uh, um, collected is also really important. So if we take a step backwards and, and you may be familiar uh, with the five P's, so in, in, in addition to um, uh, speaking about the 17 goals one at a time, uh, there's also um, looking at the 2030 agenda and, and the five P's which are uh, people, planet, prosperity, partnerships, and peace. So if we look particularly at prosperity, people, and planet, UNESCO has been doing quite a lot of things to promote you know, the intersection between culture, heritage, and these P's. So if, for instance, with prosperity, definitely we can see that there's opportunities to create jobs and to sustain well-being, particularly for women, uh, indigenous people, and youth. The image we have here is from an award-winning conservation project um, in Northern Pakistan where they trained uh, a group of young women to become carpenters. And for these women, it was, it was really life-changing. So pr previously they were dependent on you know, income from their family or their husbands. And now they're able to make an independent wage and in fact, um, hire uh, other women, for instance, um, to act as caretakers or to uh, milk the cows and so forth, other types of tasks that they would have been doing otherwise. And so in this case, um, in fact, it's created quite a multiplier effect from this conservation project. And now the women carpenters are training um, apprentices as well. We also look at the issue of uh, people, P for people. Um, and so we can see how heritage in many cases, obviously is central to people's well-being, including the build back better from COVID. So being able to help communities build back better by strengthening various forms of recovery and support mechanisms, uh, particularly to people who are important heritage bearers at the local level. 
um, you know, councils of elders, uh, religious institutions, and so forth, which um, are important in providing, you know, social and mental support in times of need. And then finally, we come to P for planet. And here we can see that, in fact, you know, climate change is a huge issue and a major challenge affecting not just everything, but also heritage as well. And so, you know, equipping practitioners, technicians, and so forth with the knowledge to be able to combat climate change and specific phenomena like desertification, again, I think is, is an important role that libraries can play as uh, platforms for knowledge sharing. So when we come to some specific UNESCO work that is related to sustainable development, I think a lot of people associate the word UNESCO with uh, World Heritage, uh, and we do have over 1,000 World Heritage sites now around the world. Um, and, and as I said, you know, it's not just protecting World Heritage for the sake of protecting World Heritage now, but it's also how to integrate a sustainable development perspective into the various processes of World Heritage protection in a way that you know creates jobs, improves the well-being for local people, um, also protects the environment, uh, as well as um, um, other aspects as well of sustainability, including peace. We also have uh, this uh, awards program that we conduct in the Asia Pacific region for outstanding conservation projects. And uh, we have actually, uh, in recent years, um, expanded quite a lot uh, the criteria for what constitutes a good successful conservation project. So it's not just about choosing the right bricks and choosing the right, you know, mortar for, for the conservation work. But now we're saying that, you know, for, for a conservation project to be successful, it has to engage the local community. It has to foster their local knowledge and their living heritage. It has to improve their, their life. And so uh, in this regard, we have been awarding special recognitions for sustainable development. And a sample project that I, I show you here is from Hong Kong. It's a rural landscape on the fringes of Hong Kong. It's two hours uh, from sort of downtown by, by ferry. And when you get here, you'll see that it's this um, uh, historic landscape that runs from a forest down to the sea, actually. And uh, there is a Hakka community, uh, as well as a kind of a um, uh, half a century old uh, farming system that was abandoned. Um, Oh, sorry, several century year old uh, farming system that was abandoned about half a century ago. And so what the project did was to revive this entire place, not just the buildings, but also the farming system. Uh, they in encouraged uh, people to come back and live here. They restored the ecology of the forests, of the rice fields, of the mangrove forests. And so in, in this way, we can see that in fact, um, um, conservation work uh, or heritage work can become very um, holistic and multidimensional. It spans environmental issues, it spans social issues, it spans, of course, sort of technical conservation issues as well. And so we can see that um, in planning the interventions um, at this project, uh, the project team really thought about things um, in, in, in a very kind of comprehensive manner. So you'll see that it, it's not just uh, you know getting the, the farms up and running again, uh, but they also thought, well, how do we you know, um, uh, take the food um, and, and agricultural produce that is produced from the farms and uh, we can uh, set up farmers markets uh, so that we can sell the produce or how do we process the food you know, to sell? Uh, how do we introduce low carbon technology um, in um, enabling the, the people to uh, establish a new life in this village, you know, and so forth. So we can see that there's, there's multiple dimensions that really um, um, reflect the various aspects of sustainable development in this one project alone, um, which is quite inspirational. And so this whole mindset about sustainable development, to be frank, is a little bit new, but also at the same time, also, also uh, embedded in our DNA. Uh, it's new in the sense that we haven't talked about it explicitly so much in the past, but we are doing so now. But at the same time, if we look back, you know, uh, anyone who remembers, you know, how sustainable development, um, um, those words were coined by the Brentland Commission um, in uh, meetings that were conducted in, in the 1970s. It was precisely at the same moment when the concept of sustainable development uh, was, was broached uh, that that's also when the World Heritage Convention was born as well in 1972. So meaning to say that these two things are, are part of the same spirit and part of the same movement to um, create sustainable development opportunities um, at the same time 
as understanding that part of sustainable development is protecting and safeguarding and enhancing the culture and heritage resources that we have. So it's not possible to achieve sustainable development if we abandon, you know, all of our history and our heritage and go forth ahead and, and you know, just try to sell lots of things. And so uh, with this reason, um, um, for this reason, uh, UNESCO has, has acknowledged the fact that, you know, when you take this message to a group of archaeologists or a group of architects or engineers and so forth, other professionals who work in this area, no one is going to deny that sustainable development is important, but not that many people are equipped with the knowledge and skills and the tools to make that happen. And so for this reason, uh, UNESCO has uh, focused on how do we upgrade heritage professionals to be able to grasp these issues related to sustainability. We have developed a competence framework for cultural heritage management. And within this framework, sustainable development is one of the core competencies that we've identified. It has as much weight as understanding heritage policy and principles. So it you know, tells you something about how important this is going to be as we begin to upskill and reskill the existing professionals. And as we educate a new um, generation of practitioners and professionals who work in this area of heritage conservation, preservation, and sustainable development. And so irregardless of the fact if you're an anthropologist or you're a carpenter or you're an engineer or a landscape architect, we're saying that this understanding about sustainable development as related and as being part and parcel of your heritage work is in fact uh, something that um, um, is a necessity for, for all. And so, um, but, you know, education, as, as many of our colleagues have said, doesn't start when you're, you know, 18 or 25 or 35. It really starts at a very early age. And so, um, you know, some of the important uh, tenets of, of the sustainable development uh, goals is, is really goals um, 16 and 17, looking at peace and looking at partnerships. And for this reason, UNESCO has developed a, a whole um, um, a series of materials um, aimed at teachers uh, as well as students uh, in order to bring heritage into the classroom. And we know that um, many um, students and learners um, access these kinds of materials through libraries. And so we would encourage our librarians who are with us today in the room to, to look into some of the materials that we produced. And uh, hopefully uh, when you um, have um, visitors to your library who are interested in learning about heritage, you could direct some of your visitors to some of this content which is available freely online. And so um, another project is um, shared histories of Southeast Asia. So for colleagues here from Southeast Asia or for, from other countries who are interested to learn about Southeast Asia, we also have a comprehensive set of teaching and learning materials related to um, education. Um, and I end uh, re related to the history of Southeast Asia. And this is interesting because in fact, um, uh, this project is the, the latest iteration of, of a very uh, long-standing project uh, initiative that UNESCO has had starting in Africa with rewriting the history of Africa from a decolonialized perspective. And so writing the history of Africa by Africans uh, and in so doing, changing our understanding of, of uh, what has happened um, on the continent. And so this, of course, necessitated rewriting history textbooks. It necessitated reflecting critically upon the existing history textbooks that were available in schools, but also in libraries, as well as all sorts of associated content, you know, that were not per se history textbooks, but it had a colonial lens in terms of presenting, um, um, you know, uh, the sociology, um, the culture and so forth of Africa. And so we, we've taken this, this uh, project and, and uh, imported it to Southeast Asia to try to focus on an understanding of, you know, learning history as a force for, um, for, intercultural understanding and dialogue rather than as a, as a tool that instigates um, ill will or, or sort of conflicts among neighbors, whether it's neighboring countries or neighboring communities and so forth. And so in that spirit, I'd like to end with um, uh, some final words from our Director General, uh, Madame Audrey Azoulay. And uh, she noted that knowing our own culture, um, our history and what it owes to others, knowing other people's history allows us to fight the feeling of cultural insecurity, which feeds populism. And I think at this sort of rather contested moment in our, in our global um, you know, uh, condition uh, these days with a lot of um, uh, conflict uh, in, in all corners of the globe, I think this is maybe a sort of a, um, a peaceful moment to end on. So with that, I'd like to thank um, all the colleagues and my email is here. 
if anyone is interested, you may uh, feel free to email me and I can provide you links to some of the materials I talked about, as well as other materials. Uh, this uh, PowerPoint will uh, has been provided to the organizers and I'll, I'll provide it again for easy reference. So you can please feel free to also request it from the organizers as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for that insightful presentation. I had a lot of words that resonate with libraries. Cultural preservation, heritage. Uh, you know how seriously IFLA takes the cultural heritage and conservation and preservation. We even have an, uh, an officer specifically responsible for cultural preservation. In school, we all taught about conservation and preservation. So there is a lot in common that uh, we do. And I have heard the, you were talking about the Africa and Africans telling their stories. I always say this to them, tell your stories in your own words. And there is collaboration between Asia and Africa, you can between the two regions, the Asia Oceania and the Africa region, where the sub Saharan region where we can learn from each other. So I, I really felt that uh, the colleagues should look at this as an opportunity and we all should be looking to working together. I also haven't had a lot. OK, I know that it's about it's because of time about um, uh, repatriation of cultural heritage. For me, that's also a very sensitive issue uh, for most of our countries. So I think most of our speakers or somebody from the floor will talk about that. Our next speaker is from, uh, is Botekas from Kazakhstan. And I will hand over to you and we'll hear from you. Thank you so much. От имени Национальной библиотеки Республики Казахстан и от себя лично рада приветствовать всех участников семинара и находиться в столь представительном месте. Good afternoon, dear colleagues and friends. I would like to extend a warm greeting uh, to all the seminar attendees on behalf of the National Library of the Republic of Kazakhstan and on my personal behalf, and to be in such a particular uh, location. Позвольте поблагодарить организаторов семинара за предоставленную возможность и участие в профессиональном библиотечном сообществе. Let me express my gratitude to the seminar's organizers for their involvement in the field of professional libraries. Необходимо отметить, как уже многие сегодня докладчики сказали, библиотеки как фактор культуры и информации активно вовлечены в деятельность по распространению основных целей устойчивого развития и, и активно также продвигают их на местах. It should, uh, it should be highlighted that libraries as a source of knowledge and culture actively promote and participate in the transmission of the sustainable development goals in local communities. Роль библиотек состоит не только в предоставлении информации к многочисленным источникам, но в предоставлении доступа к информации, но является движущей силой происходящих позитивных процессов наших сообществ, в частности нашего общества. In addition to giving people access to a variety of information sources, libraries play a crucial role in advancing the good things that are already happening in our society. Конечно, для продвижения всех целей по устойчивому развитию сообществ необходимы наши совместные усилия как внутри каждой организации, не только библиотечных, но и на правительственных уровнях каждой страны. Of course, our collective efforts are required to realize all of the goals of, uh, for the sustainable development of communities, both within each organization, not just libraries, but also at the national and international levels of government. Несмотря на техногенность наших дней, культурные ценности прошлых веков актуальны и востребованы. The cultural values of earlier ages are still relevant in demand 
and continue to excite us in the current world despite the technolo technological advances of our days. Многих поколений людей из прошлого историко-культурные памятники являются живым свидетельством вековых традиций цивилизации. Historical and cultural monuments are tangible reminders of the long-standing customs of civilizations because they are imbued with the soul of many generations of people from the past. Люди на нашей планете все глубже осознают единство человеческих ценностей и древних памятников как одно общее культурное наследие. People all over the world are becoming more and more conscious of similarities between human ideas and the ancient structures that make up our shared cultural history. И на пороге третьего тысячелетия особое значение приобретают вопросы, связанные с обеспечением сохранности материальной субстанции. Сохранением подлинности памятников истории и культуры для будущих поколений. And as we approach the third millennium, concerns about guaranteeing the material preservation of cultural and historical monuments, as well as their authenticity for future generations, are particularly crucial. Будущее не может существовать без прошлого, и залогом будущего является сохраненное прошлое. The past is necessary for the future to exist, and the past that has been preserved alone holds the key to the future. Сохранение историко-культурного наследия, в том числе документального книжного фонда, является приоритетной задачей работы службы консервации Национальной библиотеки Республики Казахстан, а также регионального центра ИФЛОПАК по Центральной Азии, который я сегодня представляю. The Conservation Service of the National Library of the Republic of Kazakhstan and the IFLA and PPK Regional Center for Central Asia, which I am here to represent, plays a high focus on preserving historical and cultural legacy, especially the Documentary Book Fund. Национальная библиотека Республики Казахстан с 2008 года является региональным центром ИФЛОПАК по Центральной Азии, техническую часть работы которого проводит наша служба. The National Library of the Republic of Kazakhstan has been the IFLA and PAK regional center since uh, 2008, the technical part of which is carried out by our services. В орбиту Центральноазиатского регионального центра, помимо Казахстана, входят Узбекистан, Кыргызстан, Туркменистан и Таджикистан. Узбекистан, Киргизстан, Таджикистан и Туркменистан are all included in the orbit of the regional center in addition to the, the, the Kazakhstan. Первоначально в работе регионального центра участвовали только специалисты библиотек. Only library specialists took part in the work of the regional center at first. Затем список участников расширился, и на сегодняшний день к нам присоединились службы таких научно-исследовательских институтов, как Институт Востоковедения, Академия наук, Институт Востоковедения имени Абурайхона Беруни, Академия наук Республики Узбекистан, Институт языка и литературы имени Чингиза Икматова, Национальная академия Кыргызской Республики, Институт языка и литературы национальных рукописей имени Махтум Кули, Академия наук Туркменистана. Then the list of participants grew, and now we have the conservation expertise of research institutions like the Abu Raihan Biruni Institute of uh, Oriental Studies of the Academy of Sciences of the Republic of Uzbekistan, the uh, Aitmatov Institute of Language uh, and Literature of the National Academy of Sciences of the Kyrgyz Republic, and the Mahtum Kuli. Institute of Language and Literature of National Manuscripts of the Academy of Sciences of Turkmenistan. Понимать особенности культурного многообразия региона и продвигать на местах международные инициативы призваны региональные центры на местах. Именно эти цели и преследует Центральноазиатский региональный центр, работа которого направлена на совместное сотрудничество и взаимообмен современными технологиями. The regional centers on the ground are expected to comprehend the characteristics of the region's cultural variety and support global activities there. These are the objectives that the Central Asian Center works to achieve uh, through its cooperative cooperation and exchange of cutting-edge technologies. 
Необходимо отметить, что специалисты на заседаниях регионального центра охотно делятся своими профессиональными наработками, так как здесь преследуется одна цель – сохранить документальное наследие для будущих поколений. Is one of the main objectives pursued here. Центральный Азиатский региональный центр осуществляет также образовательную деятельность посредством обучения в школе консервации и реставрации письменных документов, которая работает в Национальной библиотеке Республики Казахстан с 2013 года. The School of Conservation and Restoration of Written Documents, which has been operating out of the National Library of the Republic of Kazakhstan since, 20, uh, since 2013, is where the Central Asian Regional Center conducts its instructional operations. Международное сотрудничество в области сохранности и консервации документов осуществляется не только со среднеазиатскими странами, но и с другими. International cooperation in the field of preservation and preservation of documents is carried out not only with Central Asian countries, but also with others. В 2020 году Центральный Азиатский региональный центр получил статус эксперта и флопак в области физико-химической стабилизации, стабилизации документов, что также говорит о высоких заслугах Национальной библиотеки Республики Казахстан в деле сохранения, в деле проведения сохран, работ по сохранности и консервации документов. The National Library of the Republic of Kazakhstan has excelled in document preservation as evidenced by the Central Asian Regional Center's accreditation as an IFLA and PAK expert in the subject of physical chemical stabilization of documents in 2020. В международном списке ЮНЕСКО и Азиатско-Тихоокеанском региональном реестре зарегистрированы и включены и включены документы от центральноазиатских стран. Это рукописи, библиотечные коллекции и архивы. Они имеют уникальное значение и представляют важность документального наследия для совместного использования знаний в интересах взаимопонимания и диалога, в поддержку мира и уважения, свободы и достоинства человека и должны быть сохранены для всего человечества. Archives from Central Asian nations have been recorded and included in the UNESCO International List and Asia-Pacific Regional Register. They have a special significance and stand for the value of a documentary heritage for the uh, dissemination in, uh, of information in support of peace and respect, freedom, and the dignity of man. And they could be conserved for all of humanity as well. Глобальные цели по устойчивому развитию направлены на защиту планеты, обеспечение мира и процветания для всего населения. Реализация 17 ключевых направлений, несомненно, должны привести наши страны к устойчивому развитию основных сфер жизни. The global sustainable development goals are intended to safeguard the environment and ensure that everyone can live in peace and prosperity. Our nations should surely experience the sustainable growth of the major domains of life as a result of the implementation of 17 important directives. С момента начала работы по целям устойчивого развития в Казахстане вместе с программами развития было реализовано свыше 200 проектов в широком спектре тематических областей на сумму более 200 миллионов долларов США. Since the sustainable development goals implementation in Kazakhstan more than 200 projects totaling more than 200 uh, million US dollars have been carried out in a variety of subject areas. В частности, эти программы развития помогают Казахстану в решении следующих проблем, таких как устранение социальной незащищенности и неравенства, восстановление доверия населения к правительству, поддержание экологической устойчивости и способствовать высокопроизводительному экономическому росту. The following issues are, are specifically addressed by Kazakhstan's development programs. First, uh, elimination of social unrest and inequality. Second, restoration of public trust in the government. Third, preservation of environmental sustainability. And fourth, promotion of high performance, economic growth are the first two goals. 
По данным направлениям в реализации этих программ активно участвуют библиотеки, и по каждому из них идет серьезная работа для эффективного достижения цели устойчивого развития. In order to effectively fulfill the sustainable development goals, the libraries are actively participating in putting these initiatives into action in each of these areas. Несомненно, сегодняшний обмен знаниями будет способствовать прогрессу и укреплению общего вклада стран-участниц в деле продвижения целей устойчивого развития обществ и проводимая сегодня встреча тому подтверждение. The meeting held today confirms that today's information exchange will undoubtedly advance and improve the participating nations' joint efforts to advance the society's sustainable development goals. Надеюсь, что сегодня семинар наш, наш семинар принесет плоды. Всем желаю здоровья и успехов. Спасибо за внимание. I hope that our seminar will bear fruit. I wish you all health and success. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much for the interesting um, presentation. We'll now move to Australia, to Tania. Um, I will give over to you. Sorry. Oh, yeah, go there we go. All right, thank you. Um, I just wanted to start first by saying thank you so much for sharing your inspiring stories with us today. Um, so much so. No, can't. Is that better? Thank you. Is that better? Yeah. yeah? All right, I'll start again, shall I? Um, I just wanted to start with thank you for sharing your inspiring stories today. So much so, lucky last. I've got so many notes on my presentation here that um, hopefully is still no good. Ah, okay, we can't have that. I've got so many notes on my presentation here. I hope I can read it. Um, but I also wanted to say uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak today from an allied library profession, one that works uh, intimately with libraries and librarians. Uh, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today is uh, internationally focused and then turning more towards the boots on the ground approach. Approaches that uh, we developed in uh, Australia with the uh, Preservation and Conservation Centre for the Pacific uh, to help you guys do your jobs and support these wonderful initiatives you've all been talking about today. So I'll start my speech, my talk. So thank you for the opportunity to share with you the recent activities of the IFLA Preservation and Conservation Centre for the Pacific, which is administered out of the collection care section at the National Library of Australia. My name is Tanya Riviere and I'm the Director of Collection Care. Collection Care has the mandate to provide access to the library's historical physical collection through direct conservation treatment methods and strategic preventive approaches to mitigate risks to the collection. The team, or my team, are 10 trained conservation professionals with specific expertise and focus in paper, book and photographic conservation, preventive conservation approaches and physical collection emergency preparation and response. The Australia PAC also has access to significant National Library of Australia expertise in digital preservation and audiovisual preservation with a focus on analogue and digital audio recordings which directly support and promote, amongst other things, cultural and linguistic diversity through the preservation of oral history collections. The National Library of Australia provides PAC support and assistance through leveraging existing and relevant National Library of Australia initiatives and programs suitable and relevant for PAC purposes. Prior to 2017, the focus was primarily on the rise of digital collecting, preserving collections that are born digital, such as digital publications, works of art, and, and includes website harvesting, as well as digitised physical collections, 
and reformatting what we call obsolete formats. Data held on physical formats no longer supported, such as floppy disks, for example, as well as data requiring unique systems to enable them to operate. As such, the library developed the digital preservation section. This section has quickly become world leaders in the field of the use of Preservica, the digital platform for archiving, storage and collection management for digital collections. Since 2017, the focus of the PAC has returned to the physical collection. The Australian PAC supports the IFLA strategic program of work to bring together expertise from across the world concerning the preservation and safeguarding of cultural heritage through worldwide cooperation and the creation of resources in the form of the FAQs or the frequently asked question sheets. Developing documentation for worldwide access on risk management for an effective preservation strategies and the conservation in different climatic zones. Newly developed collection care policies will also be freely available and accessible on the National Library of Australia's website for review, adaptation and or scrutiny. These documents include the collection care and preservation policy, the illumination of collection objects on display policy and the food and drink in non-public spaces policy, which I'll talk a bit later on. The document in current, that's currently being, uh, being developed is an integrated pest management framework. The current focus for collection care to leverage for PAC purposes is to build on strategies outlined in this uh, integrated pest management framework. And on a more practical and operational level uh, in the library is, is to expand the reach of collection care training for library staff. Currently, my team trains approximately 250 library staff a year in face-to-face -face collection care and handling training. This year, we aim to expand our reach through a new online staff induction package, extending an understanding and appreciation for preserving the collection to all library staff and contractors who otherwise might may have very little to do with the collection in their day-to-day -day work but nonetheless work in a building that houses and stores a significant collection. An ex example of, of this training would be, why are there restrictions to food and drink consumption in some of the back of house areas? Why do I look a bit cranky at them when they walk through with their coffee, for instance? And how they can feel comfortable to respond to a collection emergency event if they are the first ones on the scene what first responders can do. The aim of this is to develop simple and effective messaging to bring all staff into the role of preserving the collection, mobilising and empowering the majority at an institutional level. And we look forward to sharing this work through the IFLA PAC forum and to be able to adapt it for wider audiences. It's been my absolute pleasure to be able to share with you a very small window into the priorities of the Australian PAC and the, and the National Library of Australia. We're excited for this financial year, which is of course already half the way through, so we've got a lot of work to continue with. Uh, but I would, um, I, I would, being here and with you all, uh, I would very much like to hear how the Australian Preservation and Conservation Centre so can, can support you and what your needs may be from us and what we can do to support your work. So please reach out to me. Um, I would very much uh, invite that dialogue. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tania Vareva. I hope I didn't butcher your surname from the Library, National Library of, of Australia. These PEC centers um, in most of the regions, and there is, uh, IFLA has made sure that they, because they take preservation and conservation of heritage sites and uh, cultural heritage um, seriously. They've have they have all these uh, 
center, the PEC centers in different regions. So there is a lady responsible for these uh, PEC centers and preservation and heritage sites and advisory groups that we have in IFLA, Claire Maguire. And I would like Claire to say something about her unit and how she works. She works in the IFLA office in Netherlands. We say it's the HQ. Claire, over to you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, it's been a pleasure to join you and meet so many people that I've only seen on computers up until now. Um, so my name is Claire McGuire. I'm on the policy and advocacy team at IFLA, where um, among some other topics, I cover cultural heritage and culture. Um, and it's wonderful to hear from just a few of our PAC centers. We have um, PAC centers in each of the regions. Um, and as as the, the the my colleagues and the director said, they're hubs of knowledge. Um, so, in terms of very in depth knowledge on preservation and conservation, please reach out or reach out to me, and I can help direct you. Um, but I want to just take a few words to say um, that culture, cultural heritage, and libraries it doesn't it can go beyond material preservation. It can go beyond. Um, these scientific preservation and conservation aspects. And even if you think you might not have anything to do with culture in your work, I promise you that you do. Um, <laughs> I think access to culture is a human rights um, question, and it's a access to information question. Um, so I think I, I want to go back to that pres the presentation that we heard from UNESCO, um, this intersection of culture and heritage. And I love, you know, there's the there's um, a few specific mentions of culture, but some of our work is really looking at the transversal impact of culture across the sustainable development platform. So in terms of culturally appropriate education, education utilizing cultural material, um, education utilizing intangible culture, local knowledge, this is all critical for sustainable development. Um, I just came from the UN Climate Change Conference, COP27 in Egypt, where we were looking at the role that culture plays in climate education and climate communication and climate empowerment. So um, I think a ta one major takeaway when we're looking at advocacy these days is that um, Culture is a human right. Culture is a right, the cultural, the right to culture, the right to participate in culture is in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's Article 27. Um, and we need to be able, we as um, the library field, as champions of access to information, of education, um, also are champions of human rights and champions of culture access and participation. Um, we can look within our spaces at how we preserve this material or this memory or this um, traditions, but also how we can help our users access it and interact with it and use it to create inclusive, just, and peaceful societies. So I, I would be really interested to hear from you um, throughout the next days your thoughts on this. And I would encourage you when you're thinking about advocacy to think about how you um, and your work can impact on this area. Um, I would just close um, by, again, bringing up um, the, the, the role that culture plays in sustainable development. Again, this is really close to the work IFLA has been doing um, in terms of advocacy and policy at an international level. We are working um, with a coalition of other organizations um, on a Culture 2030 goal, where we're already looking at what comes after Agenda 2030, um, and champion, championing, championing. Sorry, gosh, <laughs> I don't know what day or time it is. Um, we've been pushing for recognition of culture in uh, the development agenda transversely, but also as a specific standalone goal. And that goal would be um, perhaps something along the lines of ensuring cultural sustainability for the well-being of all, which intersects with appreciation for cultural diversity, diversity of cultural expressions, how culture can build peace, 
and nonviolence, of course, safeguarding heritage um, and safeguarding diversity of culture and language. So um, again, this is a close piece of work for us. This is part of the work that I do. I'd be delighted to talk more about it with you over the coming days, so thank you. Thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much, Claire. And um, you will have opportunity to speak to Claire um, during the week, if you're still here. And I know she's eager to work with all the uh, regions to make sure that the cultural heritage uh, is, and the, that you know where the Park Center is and what they do, and they support you in the work that they do in the library. For UNESCO, I think all the regions should also try and collaborate with the park centers that we have in the various regions. And then we, I, I have just noticed that we do so much in common. Oh, when Monte, uh, Montero, when you had that, that um, first screen, uh, screen that had all the SDG goals, libraries also support all the SDG goals. So we really have quite a lot in common. So in closing, I would ask you, Montera, to just say a few words uh, in closing and over to you. Are we still online? Okay. Is she last? No, she She's, oh, she had a meeting at one. Oh, okay. Um, should I give? Okay. All right. This is it from me, and I was. Um, I hope you had you learned a lot. I hope you'll go back to your respective institution and be advocates for the library, advocates for IFLA, advocates for the work that we do, because we are IFLA. And I would like to hand over to my president to come and do the closing remarks. Barbara, over to you. Oops. <laughs> try again <laughs> but you know me don't you <laughs> well don't touch it anymore <clears throat> thank you very much for all to all speakers thank you every everybody who was in the room and thank you everybody who was not in the room but who was here online this morning was very impressive, I think, not only for me, but also for many of you. We have, of you, we have seen so many impressive examples um, by our colleagues here in the room from the libraries who already uh, show their potential in supporting the SDGs in their uh, professional context. And I think it is so important that our potential partners or our already current partners uh, understand even more this potential. I would like to echo the words by Winston Roberts who, says, who said, we are a lot of people, we are a lot of people who are ready to work, who are ready to cooperate, and we need now those people with whom we are cooperate more closer to us more closer to us, more intertwined maybe, because there is a, a need for cooperation. And if the need for cooperation is not responded adequately, then it does not work. So we are really hoping for an adequate response. And um, I think it is so important that we saw like the UNESCO presentation about ICOMOS, Next time this colleague 
should also respond or should report about the cooperation between UNESCO and IFLA, not only ICOMOS. It's not a con competition, of course, but you see it, is, it should become self-evident that um, institutions and bodies like the UN, the UNESCO, uh, think when they think about SDGs and culture and even more than culture, they should automatically think, well, I, IFLA, libraries, yes, that's our partner. So we, I think we have also seen uh, the important role of the national libraries uh, in, in, in any context which we just have seen. So especially now the, the, last, the last two presentations uh, show the role of the national libraries and the really important value of the central activities which they can give, which they can then distribute uh, into, into their, their own countries. And of course, we have seen that there are so many target groups. There are so many target groups and the target groups can be addressed by different branches, different sorts of libraries. Like just uh, Ntabi just said, the grassroots level, that is one target group that is uh, well on the grassroots level. That's families, that's children. So we should start there uh, in a way which is even more en enhanced than uh, than it is necessary. Than not necessary, but then it has been done uh, so far. And of course, the PEC centers, the preservation and con conservation centers, are mainly situated or allocated in the national libraries, and they are of course. Um, crucial for the question about cultural heritage, because cultural heritage is a very uh, eminent element of uh, uh, achieving the sustainable development goals. Uh, identity, personal identity, identity as a member of a group, as a member of a nation, that is so important. So, um, my, my wish, my wish is not only that I said when UNESCO reports about the SDGs and other partners who support the SDGs, then the IFLA and the libraries should be there as well. And uh, Carly, <laughs> my wish is, you see, when, when I came in into that room, on the left hand side, there is a big poster, there is a bit stand up about uh, the SDGs, there are the cubes, and there is a shelf with publications publications that say how uh, UNESCAP uh, uh, supports and UNESCAP uh, achieves the sustainable development goals. And my wish is that there should be a publication about the cooperation between UNESCAP and the people here, so that next time we come here, we have a publication about the libraries and UNESCAP and the cooperation in achieving the SDGs. I think this, this, when you walk out, have a look, you see the libraries are missing. So uh, let's put the libraries into that context. And the whole workshop is on let's put the libraries into that context. And so thank you very much for this morning. Thank you again, Carly, for having arranged this wonderful uh, premise for us, the wonderful context in which we could work here. And we will have now, Stephen, a light lunch. Oh, well, now he's on. Against for Stephen now. Thank you very much. So I'm not Barbara, so I can knock that down. Um, I wanted to give the final word to Carly, who made this all possible, the UN librarian at ESCAP. So Carly. Thank you. Is this on? Am I on? Am I on? OK. It's all, it, thank you, Barbara. It's hard to follow in your footsteps, of course. Um, I'm inspired by what you say, and that's a gorgeous daydream that I'm going to walk away with today. So let's make that happen, I hope. Um, thank you all so much for such an engaging and inspiring day. I always feel like when I get to spend a morning or a day with, with fellow librarians and information workers, it's like, like my cup is refilled, right? And with examples at the grassroots level and examples at broad systemic levels. There's just so much to take away from here today. 
Um, some of you may have heard me say earlier in the year during IFLA's webinar that, you know, I've been with the UN working as a librarian for many years and I've always wanted there to be a stronger relationship. It's something that's, it's quite a visible absence to those of us as the working librarians in the UN that there isn't a stronger library policy piece happening, at least those of us within the Secretariat. UNESCO, of course, maybe has a stronger kind of more practical um, relationship with many on the ground library projects. But for those of us on the Secretariat side, it can be really a struggle. So this is kind of like a dream starting to come true. So let's keep knocking on doors. Let's keep kicking that door a little bit more widely open so that we can get to where we need to be. Um, I especially wanted to also, of course, thank my incredible team here, the SCAP library colleagues in the back there. <laughs> Ifla, of course, and Stephen for making this really happen. It was not me at all. Yes, thank you, Stephen. So yeah, for me, there's really simply no better grassroots organization institution to be communicating the UN goals to the world. I think I've heard it echoed in practical examples and in a broader sense today that we are everywhere, right? Aren't we? We are truly everywhere in governments, in schools, public libraries, corporate libraries, hospital libraries, prison libraries. Think about where the SDGs could go. Think about what kind of work we are doing already and what we could be doing. In research institutes, of course, in the halls of academia, museum libraries, we're, we're everywhere. We just need to take better advantage of ourselves and make sure our governments and our policymakers and the stakeholders understand that we're there and how to take better advantage of our access, whether it's through communications and outreach, which is already happening. This morning got me thinking so much about those indicators that Oliver mentioned that we don't have good data on. 1610, come on. We have to be able to figure out how to help do data collection. Um, so this is an area I hope that would be really fun to, to collaborate on. Um, right, so I don't want to take too much time because I want us to take a photo and I want, to, I want you all to get to visit our little research library here um, if you'd like to and still have time for lunch. So please let's see this collaboration grow. Um, thank you so much for engaging with us today and being here. It means a lot. Julie, on the logistics side, I imagine, Carly, you know the best places for photos. So should we do it in here? The let's, lights let's ask Rika, where would be a good place for a group photo? Up on the top or on the ground? Yeah, yeah so if everyone's... The light's good here. Yeah. I don't know, if, is, is there a standard screen background, like with the UN symbol or something? I don't know if you have that as a standard screen background. 